It's thinking about it. It's a very crowded budget meeting. It's my return, I think, that's coming to the <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. Okay, so we're, we're, we are recording now. Um, hey, David and John, I'm going to move you to attendees for the first item. Yep. Well, greetings and good evening and welcome to the City of Pleasant Hill Budget Committee meeting for Wednesday, February 22. Uh, let's just take a roll call out. Tim Flaherty's here and Councilmember Sue Nowak. Uh, also in attendance, I see June Catalano, our City Manager. I don't see Ethan, uh, but Eric Chung, our Finance Manager, Ross Yanguis, our Accountant, uh, and James, our Public Works Extraordinaire, uh, and Zach Seal, our, you know, community, not community, economic development manager, director. Anyway, greetings, everyone. Awesome. Our city engineer, and I'm not going to recognize you just yet, Jen, but hello. Um, so public comment, public is welcome at this time to address the budget committee on items within the committee's purview, but not listed on the agenda. There will be an opportunity to comment on agenda items at the time they are discussed. Comments are limited to three minutes per speaker, and you can contact us through Zoom, which is www.zoom.us. Click on join a meeting and enter the meeting ID, which is 886-5435-0320, passcode 657-204. You can also call in your comments through your telephone at area code 669-900-6833. Uh, when you want to make comment on Zoom, use the raise the hand feature. If you're on the phone, press the star nine. Eric, before we proceed, do we have any general comments from the public? Seeing none. All right, having no general public comment, let's move on to our first agenda item. But first, let me say thank you for having me back. And also, <laughs> thank you for your patience. Since I am coming in midstream, I wasn't on the committee for calendar year 2022. So to the extent we have some holdover items, I may ask some questions that you would expect me to know. But since I didn't attend the meetings last year, I may not. So thank you in advance. So number one, approve the minutes for the last special budget committee meeting on November 30, 2022. I will move the item. And I'm going to abstain. Okay. So I'll vote yes. <laughs> and and uh, therefore they're approved. Uh, item two, we have an event sponsorship funding request from the Pleasant Hill Recreation and Park District. I see that we have Jen Thoits, the marketing and communications manager for the district, but I will turn this over to Zach Seal. Oh, thank you, uh, Councilmember and Chairperson Clary, Councilmember Nowak. Um, so uh, last month, I believe it was June, the Recreation Park District submitted a sponsorship request uh, to City Staff. This request includes a total of eleven events of uh, calendar year twenty twenty-three. A total city Zach, sponsorship. Can you can you shut off your your uh, video because you're you're not coming through clearly speaking wise? Oh, okay. So, can you hear me better? Is my voice more really better? Not much better. Oh. You're breaking. I don't in. know. Well, okay. So I'll just keep talking. Uh, I can't hear at all. Uh, um, I'll stop talking. Um, I'm a little bit closer to the microphone. Um, hmm. So, I was saying, so, uh, uh, total events um, for calendar year 2023 for a total city sponsorship by the uh, $12,375. Nine of the events are regular events that you're probably very familiar with. Uh, two of them are new. Jennifer is going to walk us through and admit all 11 of those events. Um, prior to last year, uh, Tim, um, the uh, sponsorship requests uh, from the Recreation Park Department come to the C one ops. And then getting, uh, last year, they were all combined as a sponsorship package. And so we are continuing that this year. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, that one of the things that uh, Jen, Sheila, uh, and Michelle and I have talked about is that uh, 
uh, these men not only had the obvious benefit of providing fun activities for pleasant families, but they also trapped a large group of people, uh, in some cases, I think certainly some students from outside the sea and beyond, who then may support our businesses both before and after the events. Um, I hope everybody heard everything I just said. Uh, introduction, uh, I will introduce, um, I guess Jen, I may have just found that out. Uh, this is uh, Jen, uh, the marketing and communications manager for the district, uh, who has a presentation describing the events and the overall sponsorship request. So, Zach, Jen, are you able to share your screen? So, Zach, I'm just going to direct anybody who's following us to the agenda item and the uh, staff report that summarized the sponsorship request because mm -hmm. virtually nothing you said was <laughs> understandable. Um, so, uh, but Jen, let's see if, if you can wrap it up for us here. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to come to the to the budget committee meeting. Um, thank you, Zach. Um, I'm going to share my screen and jump right into the um, the presentation. But one of the things that Zach was saying that um, one of the things that we've been doing um, is putting together uh, more annual sponsorship packages um, for an entire year instead of kind of piecemealing through the year and asking for sponsorship ships. Um, it's a way to help um, both organizations kind of budget um, for the events ahead and, and plan accordingly. So, um, so this so then, presentation one, will address that. I just I'm have sorry. one question. So I, I, I think it's a great idea you're packaging it. And um, I've, I've looked at everything that's in the packet here. I noticed one of the events has already occurred. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious how the expected sponsorship of the city was handled on the event that's already happened. Yeah, no, I, I fully recognize that. Um, that was kind of just a goodwill um, event, if you will. And again, if you want to remove that from the sponsorship, you know, please do so. Um, it was just one of those things that we're such good partners we work with before. So we just put you guys in anyway, so and oh, so give we, you the so recognition, whether you pay for it or not. So, so we, so we, I just wanted to find out we did get the recognition. <laughs> yes, you did, and I'll show you some of the things. I'll talk a little bit about the event so you can all see right. what that's all about. So, Thank I'm just going to jump into the presentation screen share. Everybody, see my screen? Okay. We can. Okay. So um, as Zach mentioned, my name is Jen Thoits, and I'm the Marketing Communications and now Events Manager. So I took over the department um, last spring. So Sheila Catruvo is our event coordinator. Um, she's out on disability right now, but uh, hopefully she'll be, she's recovering quickly and will be back soon. So um, I just want to mention her as well. Let's see, it's going to slide through. So to jump right in, um, I strongly believe that events really help strengthen our community, the Pleasant Hill community. Um, they really are an opportunity to bring all different types of people together um, for a positive shared experience, whether that's a small family event or a large scale festival. Um, it's a really uh, an opportunity for people to come together and bond and, you know, neighbors to see each other, acquaintance to see each other. And I really believe that um, that bond and the community that we bring together helps strengthen our overall community and it makes it a more positive place to live. Um, our special events also draw people from surrounding communities and beyond, providing incremental revenue opportunities for Pleasant Hill businesses to come in, to come back year after year to these events. Um, Blues and Brews Festival is one of them. And I have a heat map and I'll show you in the next slide. Um, and it's also a, our events are a way for the city of Pleasant Hill to really cost effectively manage your outreach efforts. There's less city staff time and expenditures if, if we do it, if, Park and, if Rec and Park do it. Um, we do all the events. Um, you sponsor it, and it's a great way of, you know, being able to do that without, again, the staff, the money um, involved in um, in supplies, venues, and all that stuff. We do all of that for Pleasant Hill. Uh, and here's an example. 
oops. There we go. This is a heat map using um, some analytical software um, from Blues and Brews. And this kind of gives you an idea of where people are coming from, from large festivals. This map does not show outliers, like people from Kansas, people from the South Bay, like San Jose. But you can see for two days, we had um, 5.2 um, <clears throat> K people coming over a two day time period um, from obviously locally, but also from some of the East Bay parts of, of Contra Costa County. And all those people coming in, um, they eat at restaurants, um, they shop in grocery stores, they go downtown, um, and uh, they spend money. So an ideally stay overnight, especially in some of these, these areas here. Why this is not clicking forward. So the city of Pleasant Hill, we've we've worked together. We have long standing, um, we've been long standing community partners. Um, I I truly believe that together we make Pleasant Hill a great place to live, to play, and to work. Um, I think our partnerships um, attract a lot of people here um, with uh, the safety aspect, um, all the community aspects, the events, and things like that. And special events is part of that. I don't know why it's not clicking through. <laughs> Presentation. <laughs> Some previous events that the city has sponsored, and I'm, I'll am i just go through them. And then I'm gonna highlight uh, two events that we added this year. Um, last year, you sponsored our underwater egg hunt. And for those of you who are not familiar with that, um, we put a bunch of eggs inside our in pools and kids and families come and they hunt for Easter eggs. And there's usually uh, surprise eggs. There's activities on the deck where they they pick their pumpkin or I pick their take their eggs out. Um, they have games. We had a mermaid come um, so they can take pictures with the mermaid. And it's just a really fun uh, family event. And then we have the exciting egg hunt um, that uh, the city of Pleasant Hill sponsored. And um, we have activities there as well. This is like the land version of it, where we had, um, you can see photo op with Bunny, some of the, the PHPD officers taking pictures. Um, it rained a little bit this, this past year, but that didn't stop people from coming. Um, part of that sponsorship included a um, sponsorship egg for each um, of the age groups. So the, the person that finds that sponsor egg, they will win a prize basket that we put together that is from the city of Pleasant Hill. We also put out signage saying thank you for your sponsorships. And I'll show you some of that collateral um, in, the, in the following slides. Um, Aloha Family Luau is another great family event. Um, that's where um, it's really, uh, it includes dinner, has hula dancers. It's an opportunity for to families to, to get out together and uh, have a fun experience. They're not super long, um, but it's enough time for um, families to really enjoy that and kind of get into the aloha spirit right before summer starts. Um, last summer, we had the um, Pleasant Hill Family Campout where um, it's a great introduction to camping right, right here in our parks. Um, and then of course the Blues and Brews Festival for people who are not familiar with that. Um, we have free live music in the park. Um, Friday night is the pre-party. Um, Saturday is the festival where we have live music all afternoon. We have a large beer tent where over 20 local breweries come and people can and sample their beers. Um, there's vendors. Um, it's just a great, uh, great way to celebrate summer. Um, something new that started during the pandemic are Sunset Cinema Movies in the Park, where we show um, popular movies and people come and we have this huge giant screen in the park and they come watch movies. It's, it's really great. Something new 
And one of the things we do is, is create a trailer. So before the movie starts, it's kind of an advertising opportunity. Last year, um, you had your perks program going on. And so we were able to advertise in part of the trailer as part of the sponsorship. Thank you to, to City of Pleasant Hill. And by the way, here's this perks program. So we were able to advertise there. Um, Tinkers and Thinkers, that's a STEM-based um, event that we um, co-host with the Pleasant Hill Library, one of my favorite events. Um, and uh, it's really a hands-on um, experience for families to come and explore science, technology, engineering, math, art, throw that in as well. Um, and this year we were able to bring it fully back in person. It was great. Um, and then Haunted Trail, that's another pandemic um, kind of new event that evolved. Um, it replaced um, Trunk or Treat, which was um, in 2019 becoming so impacted in that parking lot, we needed more space. So Haunted Trail is where um, different members of the community, whether it's um, Gregory Gardens group, dad setting up a giant cemetery, and with things popping up and they're them dressed in full costume to stay Pleasant Hill, um, the library passing out free books. It's a way for a safe way for families to come and trick or treat um, with different community members along the park path in Pleasant Hill Park. So um, that pr pr proved to be very, very popular. Um, we had 2,500 people show up to that uh, event this year, which um, we did not anticipate at all. So it was very, very populous this year. Um, and the last thing that uh, the City of Pleasant Hill sponsored was Breakfast with Santa, um, very traditional favorite event um, where we serve pancakes and Santa comes to visit. Uh, there's songs. Um, holiday songs that the kids get to sing. And uh, of course, there's the photo op with Santa. So those are some of the events that, that were sponsored last year. And so this year, oh, and this is an example of some of the ways that we promoted the City of Pleasant Hill um, sponsorships last year. And it's all, through all different ways. Um, we have signage at the event. You can see here, this is at the underwater egg hunt. Um, we do um, a lot of social media. We always include thank you to the city of Pleasant Hill tagging you in the post for sponsoring the Night Owl Dessert Station. This was for the um, new event that we had just in February, the Pajama Dance Party. Um, this post um, reached 1,600 people on Facebook and 879 people on Instagram with uh, an engagement of 390 people on Facebook and 87 likes on Instagram. And that's all organic, so I didn't pay for that. Um, and that's just one post and we do multiple posts um, coming up to the event. And then afterwards, we always like to have a post afterwards to say, hey, thank you, wasn't this great? And so people can see photos of, of um, different people they know in the community and say, hey, that looks like something fun. Um, here's an example of the trailer. Um, this actually was a video clip, but it's not showing here. And um, it just scrolled through um, before the movie and it showed the perks program. Here's at the kids zone. We have signage here um, sponsoring the activities at the kids zone for blues and brews. Here's an example of some of the signage. We always thank the sponsors, um, tinkers and thinkers on posters on all sorts of um, collateral from, again, posters from digital and print um, media. We, you are on the, the, the box, the tinker box that goes out and distribute to um, all the families that participated in this free event. Um, here's an example of a flyer, the egg hunt flyer. And something new that we're doing this year is in our spotlight for people who um, sign up to have annual um, sponsorship agreements with us, um, or they're a long, long, long time sponsored with us. Um, we carved out some space in our spotlight recreation guide to recognize those um, community partners that, that support us throughout the year. Um, the spotlights um, 
circulation is 68,000 people locally in Pleasant Hill and um, parts of Martinez and Lafayette. So um, this is both, that's print. And then it also is of course, digital online on our website. So there's a lot of recognition from tagging to posters, um, banners. Um, we make sure that we include your logo and, and recognize you as, as, as much as we can. And thank you for our support for doing that to show that, that you really are part of these events and help making them possible. So some new events for 2023. Um, one is this um, new family PJ dance party, pajama dance party. Um, that was on February 3rd and Pumpkin Splash, which is this fall on October 8th. Um, so here's some photos from this um, dance party. So people got to show up in their pajamas. There was a lot of um, families with matching pajamas. And it's really, again, a family friendly, inclusive dance for kids and their, their grown ups. Um, as part of the recognition, um, we did pre and post event um, social media. We were on the district website, including links, tags, and cross shares to community groups. So whenever I can, I will cross share to um, different uh, Facebook groups for um, target marketing for people who might be interested in these, these types of events. And the day of an event signage you can see here, um, part of the, the sponsorship that you may or may not agree post humorously, I guess, <laughs> is, um, is like signage for the dessert bar. Um, when they come in, there's a welcome sign that says thank you to our sponsors, um, tagging you in posts and things like that. So um, this is a really, really fun event. The uh, Pleasant Hill Teen Council was very involved. Um, they led the little kids in dances, um, line dancing, you know, um, the chicken dance, all kinds of stuff. And the kids just loved it. Um, this picture shows a conga line that started and was like going throughout. And then we wrapped up the event with a bedtime story. And then the, plus, the friends of the library, um, donated books so that kids could take home a bedtime story. So it was a nice way to encourage um, reading to your kids in the evening as well. So really successful event, um, very fun. There was a photo op as well um, with a teddy bear. There was a raffle that a teddy bear was given away. Um, so it just uh, ended up being a, a delightful uh, family event. Pumpkin splash. Um, this is a floating pumpkin patch um, in um, in our pools at the Pleasant Hill Aquatic um, Park. And then there's deck activities where they get to decorate their pumpkin and uh, they'll do like little crafts and things like that. So again, sponsorship includes pre and post event recognition um, through the district website, social media posts, um, links, tags, etc. And then, of course, um, day of event signage. Um, thanking you for your involvement and your contribution. So this is a summary of um, the overall um, investment for 2013, and um, we kind of split it up by you know fiscal year. So um, the end of the um, 2022, 2023, January through June, um, fiscal year, the Q3 and Q4, um, the total sponsorship investment is, is 3,025. And that includes the pajama dance party. Again, that's optional, um, of course. Uh, underwater egg hunt, um, exciting egg hunt, the Aloha family luau, and then Sunset Cinema, we're actually having two of them this year. Um, one of them is replacing the family camp out. It will be a camp out themed movie night. It's just, we're not gonna have people stay over, um, but we'll do kind of camping theme and, and kind of encourage people to bring tents and things like that. So, um, and the other one is, is in August, you'll see later um, that um, right here on August 12th, um, that's going to be hot August nights, focusing on cars, like a drive-through type of thing, like we did last year. That um, some of the kids created little cars to sit in, actually, um, out of cardboard boxes. So it was very cute. 
Um, the second half of the year, um, starting actually the new fiscal year, Q1 and Q2 for 2023 to 2024, will be um, Blues and Brews um, Friday Kids Zone again. Um, this is the same as last year, um, Saturday Cooling Station. Um, Sunset Movie in the Park in again in August. Tinkers and Thinkers Innovation Fair. Pumpkin Splash, which is a new one. The new ones are denoted here with an asterisk. And then Haunted Trail in Pleasant Hill Park. And then Breakfast with Santa for a total in the second um, the first part of the, the new fiscal year would be 9,350. Oops. And I'm trying to scroll up. Um, so the total investment um, would be 12,375 total um, across the two, the calendar year, if you will. And so that's kind of a summary of, of the overall sponsorship package. And um, the details were um, were outlined in um, uh, it, it was outlined in more detail in, in this one. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions, go through um, through that. But I really appreciate your consideration for the request and the sponsorship consideration. And uh, I'll entertain any questions. Thank you, Jen. That was a very informative presentation. Councilmember Nowak, do you have any questions? Um, hey, Jen, what what about the the your big holiday festival at the community center? Don't we usually get requested for that as well? Um, usually not, because um, the city of Pleasant Hill does the um, the downtown event. Okay. So it's not a typically a sponsored event. Okay. Maybe I'm thinking of Rotary. Sorry, <laughs> that could be it. Um, and uh, a lot of times, usually when you know we get this from the Fourth of July, we usually have an idea, of sort of budget for the events, mm -hmm. so that we have a better understanding of you know our contribution versus the cost or the you know however it works. And mm -hmm. um, I you know I, that's obviously very difficult to do in all, this whole year package, but it's something that. I think it's important for us to sort of understand at some point where where it fits into the cost of the event and things like that. So maybe in the future, that's something you could um, include in your okay. in your package. Zach's raising his hand. Oh, I changed that. Can you hear me better? Nope. <laughs> Sorry. You could type some comments in the chat and I'll read them out loud. And then the, the only other, the last thing I, you know, I don't have any problem with, I mean, I think your, your, all your events are great and they, and, and they really do a tremendous amount for the community. I mean, that's what, uh, you know, so many people when I, when I'm out and about ask, how do you, how does Pleasant Hill build community? And it's really a combination of, you know, Rec and Parks events, the library events, the city events, you know, and, and you guys always do a great job of coming up with some innovative, uh, innovative ideas i would love to actually get invited to some of them i don't think we would love to have you <laughs> no, i don't think i've ever been invited to any of them i mean i show up for tinkers and thingers because i love it and blues and brews but i don't think i've ever gotten an invite to any of them so i, I you know it would be it would be nice for um I, I think it would be nice for some of us council members to get invited sometime so just absolutely just it out there and, and i'm i that's definitely an oversight because actually I think um, it's a great, again, a great opportunity for community outreach and to get out there and, and talk to um, members of the community. Even just having your pop up out at an event um, with the logo and, and the branding and, and stuff like that and having one person there, I strongly encourage you and I will um, definitely follow up with an invite to all these events because I think it would be wonderful if you you came. And then the last thing, I, my, my only concern on the whole list is the Kids Zone sponsor. That's a fairly large amount for that Friday night mm -hmm. uh, versus everything else. And it, that's the only one that, you know, the total dollar amount is really not large in the grand scheme of our budget. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we're sort of having to 
penny pinch on everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, that's the only one that sort of, in, in my mind, raised a little bit of an eyebrow. So um, that, those are my comments, Tim. Um, well, thank you, uh, Jen. I appreciate um, your promotional efforts and, and emphasizing the city's support of the Reckon Park District. I appreciate the increased social media presence and just the level of marketing professionalism that I've noticed uh, in relation to the uh, district's events. Um, they, As you described them, I wanted to attend each and every one of them. Even, See, I wanted to invite two. You want to invite two? <laughs> no, I don't think I had the criteria that really made me eligible for some of these events. You don't but, have PJs? <laughs> uh, well, I think I attend the unfamily friendly ones uh, more than I do the family friendly ones. So, uh, but in any event, um, I'd be happy to support uh, the request uh, as a total package. I would. I guess we need to open this up for public comment uh, since it is a request. So let's do that. Um, if you would like to comment or uh, offer some advice to the budget committee on this, you can join us on Zoom through meeting ID 886-5435-0320, passcode 657-204, or call us on the phone at 669-900. 6833 on Zoom, use raise the hand feature. By telephone, press the star nine. Eric, do we have a long list of people waiting to be <laughs> comments? Uh, no, no speakers. Uh, seeing we have no comments, we'll close public comment and bring it back to Sue and myself. I'd move the item. Okay, I'll second it. All right. Well, I think then it's approved or recommended for approval, whatever the correct lingo is here. Jen, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate right. the time and, and consideration again. Sorry, I missed the And we'll definitely uh, work on those invitations. <laughs> All right, give my best to Sheila as she recovers. I will do. Thank you. All right, uh, moving right along to agenda item three, the annual comprehensive financial report. Now, this just shows you, I think the last time I was on budget committee, it was called the CAFR. Now, I guess now it's called the ACFR. I'll turn this over to you, Eric. It was not PC doing the CAFR. All Is right. that right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the reason it's no longer called the acronym of Comprehensive Annual Financial Report is because um, it's a derogatory term in South Africa. So oh. they flipped the, the C and the A around and is now called the Annual Comprehensive Financial Report, the, the act for. Watch well, Lethal yeah. Weapon 2 or 3 and you will see where it's referenced. That's the only reason I know it. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think I've promoted John and David back and I will start the... Uh, the act for presentation. Hold on one second. While you're getting your report ready, I'll just note that Ethan Bindernagel, our Community Development Director and Assistant City Manager, joined us. Hello, Ethan. And good evening, Mayor Flaherty, Councilmember Nowak. Thanks. Okay, since I'm doing driving and, and and doing the presentation, I'm assuming you see the 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 PowerPoint in front of you. We do. Okay, so this evening. Uh, uh, we have the Annual Comprehensive Financial Report or ACFR um, presentation, as, as well as Measure K and the management letter. Uh, this is a lovely picture of the cover of the ACFR, uh, some of the events that we had uh, around City um, City Hall um, over the last year, as well as obviously the, the library. Both uh, Tim and Sue have seen this. The, the, the ACFR uh, consists of the, the introduction, transmittal letter, the auditor's report, 
um, the management discussion analysis, which is a summary of the events that's happened throughout the city over the course of the year. The financial section, the part that I like, which has the numbers, which includes the basic financial statements, the government wide statements, the fund level statements, as well as the footnote disclosures. Supplemental information that provides some additional inform information in regards to pension, for example. Statistical information gives you some 10 year history, um, financial data, as well as some of the organizational data uh, of the city. Uh, the, the auditors, uh, again, um, David Bullock is our partner, and John Waller, who's a senior manager with Macias, Jeannie, and Connell, are here with us this evening. Uh, in the ACFR, there's an unmodified opinion. Uh, that's the highest level of assurance that the financial statements are fairly presented in all material respects. Uh, and I've cut the portion of the opinion out. I, I won't read that out loud to you. Uh, <laughs> but again, um, it's an unmodified opinion, as well as that also holds true for Measure K as well. The financial statements consist of the statement of net positions, which is really balance sheet items, cash, uh, accounts payable, fund um, uh, net position, and statement of activities, which really re is revenues and expenses. Just taking a look at overall, uh, the net position went from about 61.7 million to about $63.6 million. Um, I'll touch on a few of these items. Uh, capital assets um, increased from about nearly $80 million to about $91 million. The increase for that is really the, the, the construction of the library of about, about $11 million. The other item I wanted to touch on was that net pension liability, as well as the deferred inflow of resources related to pension items. Uh, you can see that net pension liability actually decreased from $45 million to $29 million. Um, that's a combination of some of the amortization of costs that we have to do to get the full accrual for pension liability as well as the fact that CalPERS did have a very good year in 2021. They're always a, a year behind for financial reporting purposes. Uh, they had a return of, of over 20%, uh, which reduces our liability. Um, it also uh, increases the deferred of inflow. So it went from about $2.2 million in last year up to 235 because any gains on investment returns um, is amortized. And, and David, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I want to say 20 years it's amortized over a 20 year period. Five um, years. Five, you're, oh, five. you're thinking of the, for funding purposes, as you're making your, your contributions to CalPERS, that may be funded over 20 years, but for financial reporting purposes on a gap basis, it's, it's, it's amortized or smoothed out over five years. That's why, that's why David's here to, to correct me. <laughs> um, and again, so that's amortized over five years. And if we, we reported out in different couple, um, methods, is CalPERS did report a negative 6.1% return for 2022. So we know when the reports come out um, later this year, that obviously some of that will impact our, our total liability will probably go up. It will also probably mean our unfunded actual liability payments will also go up um, when those new reports come out. Um, and then last but not least, just net investment capital assets. Again, that went up, as I said earlier, related to the, to the library. It didn't go up as high because there's still about a little over $4 million in, in bond proceeds that we haven't spent in regards to the library. Sorry for all the data on this slide, but this is really covering um, the expenses and revenues. So total expenses went from about $36.5 million up to about $39 million. Uh, the increase that you can see in general government, some of that amortization of pension costs, the net, it was about $5 million. You can see a lot of that went into general government. Uh, so that also includes additional costs that we had in 2022 from our unfunded actual liability payment of additional $600,000. We had some increase in insurance premiums, as well as some, um, some payouts in regards to uh, long-term employees retiring uh, from the city. Transportation costs went down from about 12.3 million down to 9 million. Last year, you might recall that we had the Oak Park uh, Montecito uh, Street project right next to the to the new library that was completed last year. Um, so we didn't have as that was didn't re obviously recur this year. That's also the reason why grants uh, contributions of revenues is down from last year to this year. Sales tax, uh, another historic year from 10.6 to 11 million dollars. Uh, and Measure K itself from 4.9 to 5.3 from online sales. Um, it was very difficult to get um, a, uh, a vehicle or even used vehicle. Um, it still is to a certain extent uh, today. Uh, that really did improve our sales tax uh, uh, revenue source. 
Um, other taxes went up from about 6.7 to 8.6 million. Franchise fees, you might recall a, a year ago, uh, we did a new agreement with Republic Services, which included a one-time half million dollar uh, franchise fee, which we transferred out uh, with your council approval to the capital projects fund for one-time capital needs. We also had improved transit occupancy tax uh, revenues. Our TOT revenues were down, as you recall, due to COVID, which dropped to a low of 1.6 million a year ago, and it's only recovering to $2.2 million uh, fiscal year 2022, uh, but we still haven't quite reached our pre-COVID levels or, or projections that we thought TOT would be at this point. And the last thing I'll touch on in this slide, investment earnings um, from about $200,000 to a negative half million dollars. Uh, so two things. One is, is LAIF, uh, our local agency investment fund pool, which is where most of our money is invested. For most of the year, it was um, about 0.25%. Um, I think if, if you take the last quarter in, it averaged out to about 0.38%, if I remember correctly. Um, and so there wasn't much investment earnings. Obviously, today, if we were to look at uh, uh, the investment rates, it's, it's gone up uh, substantially from where it was a year ago, but we'll, we won't see that for, until the next uh, financial report. The second piece, the, uh, we're required to mark our investments to market value. It's called uh, GASB 31 or Government Accounting Standards uh, 31, which basically says at a point in time, so at June 30, take a look at your investments and what would it be as of, uh, as of June 30? And because of rising interest rates at that point in time, our, our market value adjustment was about a negative $600,000 adjustment. So that's why you see the net impact is a negative $500,000. Um, so overall, um, uh, again, even with all of that, our, our change in net position for the entire city went up about $1.9 million to $63.6 million. Just to touch on the general fund, and this does include Measure K, um, in total, about $33 million in fund balance at the beginning of the year, about $34.9 million revenues, expenses of about $43 million, transfers of about $2.7, a net decrease of $11 million. So fund balance decreased to $22.1. Uh, again, the bulk of this is, is really the, the library. I think we'll see that in, in, the, in a future slide. Um, this is general fund revenues. We've touched on most of this. Um, again, sales tax and, and Measure K was, had a very good year. You can see the TOT stand out a little bit better here on this slide from 1.6 to 2.2. Other taxes, as I kind of mentioned, was related to the franchise fees. Uh, One-time revenue was part of, was a big part of that. And I've touched on use of money and property. Uh, general uh, expenditures for the general fund. Um, uh, from about 7.8 to 9 million with increase of about 1.2. Again, half of that is related to our unfunded actual liability payment of about $0.6 million um, is that increase. And then we also capture most of the that payouts for retirees as well as part of general government. Uh, the other part I want to touch on here was really capital outlay. A, a large chunk of that, the majority of that 13.4 million, if, if not all of it was related to library cost, uh, which is now almost complete. And then for debt service, the increase is really representing the, the first full year of, of, of principal and interest expense compared to a year ago, where I think we only had three quarters of a year. Um, transfers out, I'll touch on that a little bit, an increase about 1.6 million. Um, you may recall in 2021, we were still a little bit concerned about COVID and what the impacts were, to, were going to be to sales tax. Obviously, some of those fears subsided, and we increased our some of those transfers from the Measure K funds uh, back to the gas tax for street work, for storm drain work, uh, for pet bike programs. Um, so that was about 400. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, about half a million of that was related to the, the franchise fees where we transferred that one-time revenue and put it into the capital projects fund for one-time project needs, and then about $400,000 for technology and, and vehicle uh, replacements. Balance sheet or to the general fund balance sheet, about $27 million in total assets. The bulk of that is in cash, about 23.4 million. Liabilities at only about 5.3 million. Uh, total fund balance of 22.1, uh, restricted uh, about 4.2, assigned 16 million, and unassigned 1.4. 
And I'll go into a little more detail on that on the next slide. So almost all the restricted um, uh, funds of the 4.2 million is really uh, is a bond proceeds that we did that private placement debt issue a year ago for the construction of the library. Uh, the, on the assigned portion, you know, $10 million still for the contingency reserve. We have about a half million dollars in encumbrances and then $6 million for capital projects. And we're gonna talk a little bit more of that on a later agenda item this evening. And then unassigned of about 1.4 million for again, an ending fund balance of 22.1. That pretty much is the end of my little brief presentation. Um, I, I just, I do want to thank, um, I know sometimes we don't get to see all their faces. I know Ross is here with us this evening, but I wanted to thank Ross. I want to thank Billy um, before she retires, uh, Lisa. <laughs> uh, Maria, who is a tap that really helps us out in, in a lot of different um, different areas. Sabrina, who was here for most of that fiscal year, but she's moved on to, um, to a different city and good luck to her. And all of the city staff that help out that are on this. I know obviously Ann and Anton and Ethan are on this as well as June. Um, obviously, David is here and he, he works for, for you and the council to let him have his whatever he would like to say to you, um, the management letter as well, um, and we'll take any questions or comments. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. Um, a couple of things to know. I think, you know, Eric did a really good job summarizing the financial results for the year. Um, you know, I like to talk about at least a couple areas that we focused on as part of the audit. You know, CalPERS is a, is a big obligation on your books as, as a, a participant in that plan. Um, and there was a significant decrease in the NPL, which is always good to hear when the investments do well. Uh, and as Eric mentioned, the, the measurement date, though, is June 30th, 2021. And, and the reason is because, um, you know, cities like Pleasant Hill can't wait for uh, CalPERS to finish their audit before you finish yours. And so... Um, so, so GASB uh, has allowed the, the reporting of one year in arrears uh, to accommodate that timing. And it's really the only thing in your financial statements that's re reported in arrears. Otherwise, everything's you know reported as of June 30th. Um, but just one other thing I just wanted to mention is, you know, as, as Eric talked about the fact that there's been a correction. You know, there was a negative return this year for CalPERS, but on top of that, CalPERS made a, a decision to reduce the discount rate. So there is going to be a, a secondary impact, not just the correction of the investment value, but the discount rate on next year's measurement date. Uh, I believe, you know, CalPERS audit's done. Uh, the information to the employers may or may not be out just yet, uh, but it'll be known soon and in time for, for the city to do its proper planning. But that's just financial reporting uh, purposes. It's not, it's not necessarily how the, the city is funding the plan. And so that's done separately, but just, just wanted you to be aware of that that nuance. Another big thing for cities this year, or for governments in general, was a, a lease standard, a standard on, on leases, um, GASB 87. And so some cities were impacted significantly because they have a lot of leases. The city of Pleasant Hill was not. There really wasn't any significant leases um, uh, that the city was required to report in its financial statements. It's just not how the city finances is assets. And so that's fine. I just wanted you to be aware of it. A lot of governments had spent a lot of time implementing that new standard this year. Uh, that wasn't an issue for the city of Pleasant Hill. And then finally, the other thing that, um, that Eric, you talked a little bit about investment earnings. And I just want to share a little perspective. You know, we audit a lot of governments here in California and California is very restrictive on the types of investments that, that uh, governments are allowed to invest in. And so you, a lot of times you're invested in you know, government agency notes and other kind of fixed income securities or pools like LAFE. And, and, and so a lot of governments had a negative earnings for the year. And that's really reflective of the adjustment to fair value, as, as Eric had mentioned. But I just wanted to add to that, that that's something that's usually not recognized. Most governments hold their investments to maturity. And so you're really not losing any money. That, that loss is, is really just a provision, accounting provision to to show the market value as a, a for an investment as a particular date, but you know as that investment matures, you're going to collect all of the interest and so forth on it. It's just going to be an interest at a much lower rate than the market rate, which is why you've taken a loss in 2022's financial statements. And then uh, the last thing I wanted to mention uh, that Eric didn't talk about because it really wasn't significant this year was you know the the ARPA funding that's come in. 
it's come in two tranches. In 2023, there wasn't a lot of that money recognized uh, that was spent during fiscal year 2022, uh, but there was enough to require a single audit. So the city uh, historically ha hasn't met that threshold or hasn't always met that threshold of having a single audit. And a single audit is a federal compliance audit. It's an audit when you receive federal assistance that you're required to uh, have a, an auditor, you know, basically ensure that the money was spent in accordance with the laws and regulations of whatever that grant was. And so uh, because of the ARPA funding, uh, the city will probably be required to have a single audit for the next several years, you know, at least in the foreseeable future. And um, we're in the process of doing the single audit for fiscal year 22. The deadline for that is March 31st. So uh, we're still uh, about a month and a half, a little less than a month and a half away from from uh, finalizing and, and reporting on your your federal funds. The uh, federal funds that you did spend during the year are are included in your financial statements. It just wasn't a real significant amount. Um, in terms of of the audit opinions, we express unmodified opinions. You know, Eric kind of highlighted the the opinion I think at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and so basically what we're saying is we have agreed with how management has reported the financial statements. Um, we issued uh, opinions. Uh, for the city as a whole, but also uh, for a, a, uh, the separately issued report of, uh, for Measure K. And, and so that that really is just a focus, right, on just the Measure K funding, both the money coming in through the sales taxes and the money money spent. And so it's a more narrow presentation with, in which we looked at specifically for the Measure K. So that's been completed. Um, Eric mentioned a management letter. We refer to it as uh, required communication. Uh, it's, it's addressed to city council. It's basically a, a summary of our audit. And what you see in your financial statements is our opinion, but what you see in the, the communication letter is just a little more context to, to the audit. We talk a little bit about new standards and, and the, its impact. We talk about you know estimates that are included in the financial statements so that you're aware that not all of these numbers may materialize. There's estimates in here, and and, and everybody that produces financial statements needs to include some form of estimates because everything isn't known at the time the report is issued uh, in all cases. Um, so I'm also happy to report that we had no uh, reportable matters as it relates to internal controls or no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. You, you won't have the final result of, of that evaluation until we complete our single audit uh, and that'll be coming to council I assume sometime after the March 31st deadline. Uh, and with that, I'd be more than happy to address any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, David. I just am curious, what is the published discount rate uh, for, I guess, the current fiscal year? For, for CalPERS? For CalPERS, right. Yeah, so, so they had just uh, approved the new rate to 6.9%. So they, they reduced it from uh, 7.15, so 25 basis points. So, you know, there is a, uh, I'm not sure in the, because you're in a cost sharing pool, you know, the information is available when you look at it, but th there's a disclosure uh, sensitivity analysis that, that lets the reader know if the discount rate goes up 1% or down 1%, the impact that it would have on the liability. In this case, it's 25 basis points, so it's only a quarter of that 1% impact. Um, but uh, I don't have a specific number for you, but the number will be published very soon. But the, but the, the new discount rate is going to be the 6.9%. For any non-financial professionals following, the reduction in the discount rate would generally indicate an increase in the city's required contribution in future years. Right? So, so my question is, my understanding was it was the risk, their, uh, their risk decision to their risk planning or whatever that allowed them to reduce the discount rate because of the high returns. Yet, so we're reporting the decrease in the unfunded pension liability, but the increase from the dis reduced discount rate is coming after the fact. It's not done at the same time. Because when I, I mean, I was at a CalPERS talk, well, I guess last year sometime, and they had indicated that, and. There were a lot of people, a lot of cities at that point that were expressing concern that they wanted their unfunded liability to come down and they were surprised mm -hmm. about um, calipers buying down the discount rate instead. But so we're gonna see that in two steps. We're gonna see it unfunded mm -hmm. liability come down because of their great returns and then it's gonna go up because they bought down the discount rate. Well, is that, well, is that I, what I'm understanding? 
Well, uh, the, the when when CalPERS and David correct me because I think David, MGO is actually the artist I think or was or is the artist for CalPERS. But when CalPERS adopted their risk mitigation strategy, the thought process was, and I'm forgetting the exact rate, but any any time they have uh, investment returns in excess of was it twelve percent, fifteen percent, David, I'm forgetting the exact number. Um, anytime they had you know very good years, basically. Uh, they were looking to, they were basically going to look at reducing the discount rate because the thought process was that uh, we're going to take some of those gains and reduce the discount rate. So some of those gains would hopefully or pretty close to wash. They would be a net zero impact um, by reducing the discount rate and taking that a little bit off the top was the was the hope in the plan. Now, I think in the initial years um, when they do that, though, there is an, um, an increase to our liabilities in those initial, those initial years um, as, they, as they readjust that discount rate um, down. Um, and then in theory, it would eventually wash back out um, as you get further along the curve. Um, so we the reality is we will see an impact uh, to, the, to the reduction, at least in the initial years, assuming that, and then it would eventually wash itself back out in the future years, assuming that all of their other assumptions held true. David, did I get that basically right? Is there anything I missed? No, I think that's right. I, and I don't have all the specifics. Yeah, we, we, we've we audited CalPERS in the past. We have not been the auditors for the past uh, two years. But I would say that, you know, there's two different ways to look at or two different ways of looking at it. One is is funding, right? More of a budgeting funding progress um, perspective, which you have you're concerned about because you're, you're, you're managing right. resources. And then there's a financial reporting perspective, which is purely just a calculation as of a specific date, and this is what it is uh, in terms of reporting a liability. That's kind of where I my focus is on financial reporting, and, and I don't have the perspective maybe of, of, of the funding progress and the budgeting, but but the idea is that, you know, as Eric mentioned, in your good years, you know, um, you're going to take a little bit off the table and, and try and get that discount rate to something that's a little more, a little bit more manageable and, and maybe easier to meet. You know, there's a lot of evaluation out there on what pension plans should be at in terms of discount rates. Um, I think CalPERS was on the higher side. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they're trying to get it down to, I don't know if it's, they're targeting like 6.5, but I think they're trying to get it down to somewhere uh, a little more in line with, with other plans. And, and a lot of it has to do with the types of investments that, that they're investing in and, and the expected returns from those investments and, and maybe trying to shore the, the uh, the risk of, of not meeting those those objectives. Yeah, well, it was it was an interesting meeting. I, my question is really more timing because I thought their risk mitigation plan sort of uh, acted in sync, so that the amount that are with a good year of twenty one percent or whatever, we would see a little bit of a drop in in the unfunded liability, but not as much as we would have thought because the discount rate had dropped. Right. What I'm hearing that this 29 million that's on there today is really the benefit of the 21 percent and the risk mitigation buy down of the discount rate is going to hit us later. That I, that's what I'm really asking. It's a it's a timing of when these two things are being reported that I'm asking. Right. Yeah. And and and, and because the valuation is always, you know, you have to have your numbers at the beginning of a fiscal year, and so you're always you know working two valuations back. And so, you know, and that's why there's a longer amortization period in terms of, you know, when Eric talked about 20 years for the smoothing of, of actuarial assets, right. there's a lot of other factors that go into that. That So I, I think what we're, what maybe I'm doing is confusing you because you, you have this perspective of how you're getting your information from CalPERS. And then I'm talking from a financial reporting perspective where we're, we have a hard date of June 30th and we're measuring everything as of that date. Um, and, and we're not taking into account, it doesn't take into account how a plan is funded. It's, it's purely a measurement um, on, on June 30th every year of what the actuary believes the liability to be at that date and the actual investments in the fiduciary trust that relate to Pleasant Hill. And, and so it's taking those two numbers and coming up with a, a, a net pension liability uh, without taking into account you know, how it's being funded. But don't they have to use a discount rate to to calculate that? Right, and that yeah, and they still right. So they're you're saying they're using the seven point one percent in this calculation, not the six point nine five. Right. So, so 
it's a timing issue, right? That, that's yeah, that's what I was getting at. And then the second thing is with 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 that with the excellent year and the decrease in the unfunded liability, how does the calculation work that we ended up still paying six hundred thousand dollars additional on the unfunded liability? Uh, uh, unfunded liability. How, why did that go up if the general number went down? I mean, I'm glad it did if it helps it reduce it in the future, but I'm just trying to understand. I know that the unfunded liability gets amortized over, you know, what, 30 years or something, but uh, how, if our unfunded liability number goes down, did our payment go up? So, I mean, in my mind, that's the difference between what, what David's talking about is that the financial reporting purposes, it's basically just put, take, putting your thermometer in at, at June 30 and, and how hot is, or cold is it at that point in time. When the right. unfunded actual liability payments, that's determined over, at three years behind. Oh, um, all right. Okay. Now I, I understand. So that's a, the timing as well. Yeah. The payment is actually three years and the, and the accounting is two. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That, that helps me uh, understand that piece of it. Um, I had what, uh, only one other question, and that was really just, um, Eric, do you know, I, I know you weren't around then, but do you recall what our sort of peak TOT number was, just to uh, compare uh, to the 2.2 we're at this year? Yeah, so, so our peak was about right before COVID was about 2.5. Um, oh, okay. So we're not that far off. But this, but, I, but we were hoping by this point in time, we'd be closer to 3 million, because by 2.5, oh. I think we only had a couple of months of, and I'm forgetting I should know this off the top of my head, but forget it. The name of the hotel that just opened at that point in time. Um, I thought the, Ellen, the, the Homewood yeah. Suites. The Hilton yeah. Homewood Suites. Yeah, the, the, our, the, the newest hotel just opened, and, and that's right. why we thought we'd have a much higher number because um, it just opened and only been opened, I oh, think, okay. maybe a, a several months or maybe six months at that point in time. Okay, got it. All right, so the 2.5 would have been excluding or only a partial year of that hotel. So we would be hoping for a three million dollar number with that hotel in a full year capacity. Correct. Correct. That's what we're hoping for at that point. Okay. 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 Just, just following up on that uh, projections we have since uh, June 30, 2022, do they seem to be on target to meet the three million projection, or do we not have enough data yet to know? We don't have enough data because um, just like. Um, most things, it's about a quarter behind uh, when we actually get the, the, the TOT revenue from the respective uh, hotels. Right. So is it a GASB requirement that you have this summary of uncorrected financial statements, misstatements, which are not material? <laughs> it's an audit requirement that they that they have to at least tell you that so that, um, you know, full disclosure, basically. I mean, I find that the most odd statement title uh, uncorrected financial statements, misstatements, and then you read through and they're not material misstatements, but right. apparently they're erroneous or were erroneous at some point in the in the past. I mean, is there a time period where these alleged uncorrected non-material misstatements fall <laughs> off? Yeah, so, so typically they, they relate to timing. Typically, like if you have a, a payment uh, that you made in July and it should have been accrued as a, a payable uh, and didn't get reflected or some maybe allocation of it didn't get reflected. Um, or in this case, maybe there's interest earned on a loan that's not reported. You know, there, there's sometimes immaterial amounts. Uh, so immaterial amounts, you know, typically when it's a timing issue, it just gets corrected in the next period. Others might just be a, a, where the city chooses not to report something because it's immaterial. Um, and so it's not like, uh, you know, there's missing cash out of the drawer. It's usually just a financial reporting matter that was deemed to be immaterial and not necessary to correct. Um, it really stems from, a um, an, a, an audit, an audit standard that was implemented, uh, probably about 10 years ago where, you know, we're required you know, the, the, those charged with governance, and in other words, you are, you're, you're required to be aware of materiality. And when things are passed on that are immaterial, if there was no reporting of it, you would, you wouldn't really have an understanding of, you know, what we deem to be material in the financial statements. And so uh, this list of uncorrected misstatements, uh, 
if you can excuse the name, is just a way to inform you that, that there were small numbers uh, that were not included in this year's audit. Uh, typically, it's not things that are missing, like missing things. It's more of just financial reporting of those matters. I mean, very simply, for example, um, like your pg e bill, it, it may include June, July, and August. Um, the city will just, when we receive that invoice, we will account for it in the new fiscal year. We, in, in perfect accounting, if we want to be completely precise and accurate, we would prorate that month of June back to July 2022. Um, uh, most agencies, I'll be honest, don't. I mean, since July and August is the majority of the bill, and then you, and we you, you stay consistent with the new fiscal year. Um, it gets reflected in the new year, but in pure per perfect accounting, we should have reflect prorated that month of June back to uh, the prior reporting year. No, I just called it out because it just was an odd title. And since it wasn't material, I question why it's being called out if it's not material, but I do understand David's explanation. It's to educate us supposedly on the, the line that separates material from immaterial, although it didn't. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there, there is a, one other threshold that we consider to be, we use the terminology trivial. If it's trivial, we don't include it in the letter. So what you're getting is numbers above trivial, but less than materiality. Gotcha. But not a significant, significant deficiency is something different altogether. Yeah, that that's a internal control Material. terminology. So internal controls don't have anything to do with numbers. They have to do with his procedures, uh, right? Have procedures process. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. Um, I, don't, I don't have any other questions. Do you, Sue? No, that's it. That was it. That was it for me. I was a little worried, uh, Eric, when I thought you were going to give us captions for all the photos at the beginning of your presentation that this was going to go on a really, really long. <laughs> no, I. I try to keep. Yeah, I try to keep it brief. Um, with that, you no know, staff is just looking for hopefully your recommendation for um, to forward this to, to council. Um, and just because of the timing, I know that um, we, we just wanted to under, uh, prepare that if you if you were okay with this being on consent or if you really uh, want this on regular agenda. And staff is okay either way. Um, oh well, um, you may know this about me. I'm not a fan of the consent calendar, and certainly when it comes to the finances or economic situation of the city, even more so. So, um, Sue and I would be delighted to hear your presentation. <laughs> um, One more time. <laughs> not a problem. Um, I just just talked with Juanita, and you'll see this on a few of the other agenda items this evening, just because of the timing that she just wanted to verify that this evening uh, through this process. Yes. Uh, um, Certainly recommend it to the city council, and I would recommend it be put on the action calendar. Thank you. I would I would concur. Thank you. Okay, and thank you very much, uh, David and John. I don't know if you're going to report on some of these other items that are Eric's responsible for, but let's move to item four, which is the pension rate stabilization program funding policy update. Okay. Okay. Next presentation. Um, uh, for, but David and John, there is an ARPA item if you guys are bored uh, this evening. Uh, oh, they quickly left. <laughs> yeah, they left before you even got that out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. Oh, David came back just to uh, laugh at that. <laughs> <laughs> no, this one, assuming I can start it. Um, uh, so about a, a, a year ago, I, I know, know that Tim was not on, on the, uh, the budget committee um, last April, but he did approve the, as part of the city council, they, the city council approved the pension rate stabilization program and the funding policy, um, which was the initial contribution of a million dollars um, into the PARS trust. Uh, but included in that was a funding policy of how we would, can, um, if we had funds available to put additional money into the PARS trust. Just to take a little excerpt out of the staff report um, and out of the funding component, which I kind of underline, um, that myself as well as the city manager, based on unassigned fund balance when revenues exceeded costs, not including Measure K funds, um, and the audit financial statements, that that contribution, um, if it was in excess, uh, we would recommend for additional uh, contributions to the par trust of the higher of 10% or $50,000. Um, again, taking from the the finance from the staff report, 
uh, breaking down the actual general fund fund balance, which is made up of the general fund, the Measure K fund, um, and when we initially create the CARES Act fund uh, when COVID first started. Uh, just taking a look at general fund only, we began the year with $11.9 million. Revenues including transfers of about 29.3, expenditures going and transfers out of uh, 29.3, a slight deficit fund balance of $10,000 or a little under 11,000 with uh, the general fund ending at $11.9 million. So technically based on the funding policy that we have, we don't have excess revenues over expenses. Um, so there's uh, there is an, a, a recommendation by staff to put additional funds in, um, into the PARS trust. Uh, this based on the audited financial statements. Um, I know that we will be going through a review of seeing how we're doing this year, and uh, maybe we can make a re recommendation at that time. But again, um, even if we don't, again, when the audit is done again, we'll come back to you um, with the the next act for the, to see how we're doing. If there's additional funds to put into the trust. Uh, really, this was an informational item, unless there's specific questions or comments that you have. I just have a question. So, so with the um, uh, fund that we created, uh, do we have a, a report on the returns of that particular fund? You know, uh, doing investment wise, is that here in, in front of me on this chart that I'm just not it, seeing? It is not. So, our plan was actually at the. Um, I talked to them at the at the finance conference actually a few weeks ago. Our plan is to actually have um, PARS as well as Chandler come and make a presentation to the both of you um, at either the next meeting or the meeting after that, just depending on scheduling. But that's not in front of you this evening. So I I have a sort of a question. When we first, when we, when we did the budget for this year, we actually expected a bigger deficit and a decrease in the fund balance. And so we've, we've got an unassigned fund balance right now, 1.4 million that we actually expected to disappear. So we actually did 1.4 million better than we were originally anticipating. Right? Yes, that, yes. from a budget that, standpoint. Yes, from a budget standpoint, you're correct. Yeah, because I, you know, I think when we, when we, when we went through the draft, uh, you know, I would think I was, in my mind, I was sort of thinking how we did against budget, not necessarily the actual increase to the unassigned. So we're sitting with 1.4 million unassigned. And is there, do you foresee enough concern about the next year that we wouldn't consider taking a small piece of that and adding it to the, to the, to, to the trust? Um, what, what, just the preliminary review of this year so far, I mean, we're on, on it seems, looks like we're on track based on budget, which just means that we will I mean the preliminary, I mean, I'm sorry, not the preliminary, the adopted budget had us um, overspending uh, revenues, expenses over revenues of about one, um, 1 1.4, to be honest, which is what's in my head. Um, so in theory, if the, if the budget played out exactly the way that was adopted, uh, the unassigned would be used up. Um, this year, fiscal year twenty three. Okay, well, I, I, I guess it, I, you know, and I'm okay with it as it stands now. I guess um, I would certainly think if somewhere along the line this year we think we're going to do better than that and not take away all that unassigned, that I would, I would like to, to reconsider whether we put some small amount in there. We are going to be facing bigger and bigger unfunded pension liability costs. And if we don't fund that a little bit, we're just going to be facing a year where it's going to be ugly. And so um, to the extent we can gain anything by putting a little bit away, I guess I would just like to revisit that as we go through this year. If we're not going to be using up all that unassigned, maybe we can talk about it again. It's definitely <laughs> I think it's a good idea. And Eric, just, I don't know if I was clear, but I was asking about the investment return on the trust, not on the general fund overall. Like, yeah. That, that, no, you, you were, cl you were clear, uh, Mayor Flaherty. Uh, no, so PARS, who is who we have the money invested or um, is administering the PARS trust. Uh, we, we are going to have them come back and do a presentation to the both of you of how that trust is doing. Um, it's technically not on the agenda this evening. Uh, and, uh, and we're also going to have Chandler come back as well, who we have about uh, about $5 million of our investments in 
with that with city money invest with them and have them do a presentation as well to the both of you um so so that we do have a plan to come back to you just not this evening fair enough um thank you for the report anything further sue on this item no that was it all right let's move to item five our measure k update do you want to get public comment there, Tim? Um, well, it's just an informative <laughs> piece. It's not an action item. So I don't, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, mean, I guess uh, Eric, is there anybody I'm waiting to comment on anything? <laughs> not unless staff would like to chime in. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, a good one. Let's just move on to item five, the Measure K update. Uh, I get to continue. Um, next presentation. Um, <laughs> we tried to group them all together. So you didn't get a chance to catch your breath or even take a sip of water. <laughs> Where's my measure K one? Sorry. Uh, are you seeing this presentation or the or the, the double slide? No, we're seeing the presentation. Okay. At least I am. Um, again, for for Mayor Flaherty, um, we came to Budget Committee last November because uh, preliminarily we thought we had some excess Measure K funds. Uh, the reason for that is when it is you both may recall when we went out with Measure K, the original assumption was about four million dollars in annual sales tax revenue. Um, and we had some proportionate shares going to uh, the streets program, the uh, bike and ped and, and storm drain. When COVID happened, um, we were concerned about sales tax revenues, uh, especially the council. So they ramped down some of the expenditures on some of those other programs because um, we wanted to make sure that the library construction continued. So we reduced expenses. And then lo and behold, with, with uh, sales COVID, it didn't reduce sales tax and increased it. So we had better uh, sales tax than we thought, and we had less expenses. So that what's uh, what's created is we have some um, some excess unassigned Measure K fund balance um, that we want to pr provide some potential uh, shovel ready projects uh, to you to hopefully recommend to council for adoption that we could move forward on some of these projects. Uh, so again, you kind of heard a little bit about this. Uh, earlier in the in the audit report, but we have about $10.2 million in, in Measure K ending fund balance from the audit report. And from the staff report, what we we're trying to show was um, some of the some possible some of the things that City Council has already approved, some of the costs that are remaining on the library, and some potential uh, projects as well as a Measure K reserve. So for the $10.2 million, Council's already approved about $93,000, one to wrap up the Gregory Garden storm drain and about $8,000 for a bike pedestrian study. We have about um, $4.9 million budgeted and estimated uh, for the library. I know Anathan's working on that to wrap that up. And then I'm gonna hand this over to Ann and then Anathan um, on the projects that's presented for 1.1 million in maintenance and about $800,000 for engineering. So I'm gonna stop sharing at this point and hand this off to Ann. Good evening, Mayor Flaherty, Council Member Nowak. I am going to try to share my screen. Let's see. Oh, there it is. Can you all see that? And then yeah. I'm going to go to slideshow so it's not. Hmm. So as Eric said, back in uh, the budget committee, yeah, November. You're not on the first slide, though, Anna. Oh, no, Did, no, okay. No. Let me let me start this again. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> so back in November, when we went to the budget committee, uh, the council we got from the budget committee at that time was to look at some of the available fund balance in Measure K and try to find projects that would be shovel ready, uh, that were appropriate for Measure K. So you know me, the projects that are close to my heart is street resurfacing. Just a quick overview, because we haven't shared this in a while. Uh, the city just completed their street survey uh, with MTC. Uh, it was called PTAP 23. 
and uh, it was done last fall. And so in that in that survey, I actually included the streets that we were paving as part of the 2022 street resurfacing project. Uh, so that included two streets, uh, two arterial collectors on Chilpancingo and on Grayson, and then two neighborhoods in Poets Corner. So because of that, we see a slight increase in our interior arterial and collector network. They're both now, the average PCI is 77, uh, which is good, great. And then our residential network is stayed the same at 67 than it, than it did in uh, 2019. We were 67 then, we're 67 now. Um, because of COVID, our paving stalled a little bit, uh, but our overall network actually went up one point. Um, so that's the good news. Um, hmm. So again, here's the, this is just our arterial collector network. So this is what we did in November, 2022. We did Chilpancingo from Contra Costa Boulevard all the way down to the city limits. And then we did Grayson Road from Heritage Hills all the way down to the cemetery to re release Valley Road, also our city limits. Um, so that helped boost up our PCI for our arterial and collector network. Uh, upcoming and on our tiers and collectors. Um, so we are going to do a pothole repair project after all the rains we have in place. We're going to repair. I have my staff out there now doing temporary repairs. We're going to have the contractor come in and do uh, permanent repairs on just our tiers and collectors. Uh, the engineering division has Contra Costa Boulevard from Harriet to Viking, and that is, I believe, scheduled for construction in 24. And then we're also looking at Taylor Boulevard from the city limits to Pleasant Hill Road, working with the engineering division to get the striping nailed down. And that is the next arterial and collector street that we'll be targeting. Um, North or south city limits? Uh, to not the Contra Costa Boulevard end, the Lafayette okay. end. So starting at Lafayette yeah. and coming down. Uh, there's a lot of construction that's going on between Contra Costa Boulevard and Morello wow. on Taylor. So I haven't really, I might look at some design there but I, I'm not really planning any construction there until that work is done. Yeah. Um, just, just a brief overview, the arterial and collector work that's been completed. Um, we did Grayson and Chilpancingo, um, and that was great. We did a FDR, which was a recycled asphalt with an asphalt overlay. Uh, we did a portion of Oak Park Boulevard when we did the library from Monticello to the Canal Trail uh, in 2021. We did Pleasant Hill Road from Gregory to Taylor in 2020. Paso Nagal Road, you may recall, we did as change order work um, in 2019 as part of the 2019 street resurfacing project. And when we did that project, we also did Cleveland, Woodsworth, and a portion of Grayson. That should not say Grayson Lane, it's Grayson Road from Twinview down to Taylor. So we've done some significant work on our arterials and collectors um, between 2019 and 2023. That is one of our city goals, right? To keep all our arterial collector network up above a 70. So we have reached that, you know, we're, we're staying consistent with our goal there. Um, these are just, you know, so good, very good. We usually just do a slurry seal. This is the range we're in right now, the overlay range for our uh, residential streets. We're doing the two neighborhoods in Poets Corner, and I'm really happy to report that once we're done with those two neighborhoods, our overall residential street system is at a PCI of 50 or higher, which is great. Um, it, it's not great, the designation, it's great for our, res, uh, our residential streets because when we started our street resurfacing program, the whole network was down about a 30. So we've put some significant resources into bringing our residential streets um, up to a good working condition. And so this was our five-year plan, right? We did um, the Blue Stars was 2019. And we did actually a portion of R4, but the bulk of it is gonna get done when the water district's finished. And then during COVID, we spent some of our resources and just did R19, which is uh, the streets between Gregory and Boyd, right in front of uh, the community center. And R7 and R20 are what we're gonna do right now. So I have been working with the contractor. Um, you know, as you recall, in December, it started to rain. And so the, uh, so, you know, the contractor went home and then the plant has actually was shut down. You know, they usually shut down for a month in the winter to do all the repairs. Uh, but for the case of spending some Measure K funds, this actually helped us 
they the contractor is scheduled to come back and start paving in Poets Corner uh, next week, actually. And of course, it's going to rain Monday and Tuesday, so they're going to start <laughs> Wednesday. Um, but the good news there is R17, you can see that we, we identified this as part of our five-year plan. R17 is... Um, and coincidentally, it works really well because we paved Grayson Road, R17 of the residential streets that are around Grayson. Um, it was identified in our five-year plan. And they are the next indicated neighborhood. So that is that is good news. And it makes sense to me if we have available Measure K funds, we go to this neighborhood next. Um, with our bike and ped plan, our materials and collectors are going to be getting um, some upgrades you know, thermoplastic bike and ped upgrades. Uh, this neighborhood, I've already checked with engineering, they don't need any thermoplastic upgrade, uh, sorry, bike and ped upgrades. We're just gonna go back to the existing striping that's on the street. Uh, so it is a good neighborhood to go to and it was identified. So here's our seven that's gonna be starting next week in Poets Corner. And then here's our 20. And so if we just go back to that map, they were identified in our five-year plan. You know, this is what's under construction now. This was the next neighborhood that we're gonna go to based on our PCI network. Uh, so we're not jumping ahead, we're not skipping neighborhoods. Um, and this is, this is the residential zone I'm actually uh, proposing that we add to the existing 2022 street resurfacing. So here's Grayson and here's Taylor. So it's the Heritage Hills neighborhood and the green means nothing. It just happened to be a color that popped. It doesn't indicate any sort of uh, condition of the street, but we'll also hit golf links, Iron Hills, Butner and Docky Flats, and these little streets going up to Dobbs and around in Taylor. Um, so the existing contract with MCK services, you may recall um, on September 12th, we, we awarded the 2022 contract to them um, and they've only completed the, res the arterials and collectors. So their existing contract was about 4.5 million. Um, all the work that would happen in this neighborhood is uh, the same work that we're doing in Poets Corner. And so I've met with the contractor and they have agreed to hold their unit bid prices when they bid the project back in September. It's, um, they're gonna hold those numbers across the board for the work. Um, it, that's a, a actually a cost savings to the city. Um, asphalt's gone up, everything has gone up. Um, so the fact that they're willing to hold their bid prices, it's it's a little bit of a win for the contractor because it's March and you know they want to keep their guys working, uh, but they're also already in the city. They don't have to remobilize. They have everything here that they need. It's going to be the same. It's going to be the same treatment. I've met with the sewer district and the water district, and we've entered into contracts with both of them that they will be reimbursing us to uh, the sewer district. We're just going to be adjusting their manholes. In R17, uh, we're going to be entering into a contract with East Bay Mud uh, to replace all of the valve cans with a new G5, G5 valve can, and East Bay Mud will be reimbursing us for that work. So that money is gets reimbursed to the city. Um, I've also met with um, the city attorney's office, Grant Orbach, just to make sure that we could add this change order without it being any sort of material change. And he looked through the documents and he ran the numbers and he's agreed that it's not, uh, they're gonna hold the bid prices, we can extend the quantities and that he's comfortable that it's not a material change. This is something that he's very comfortable we could add as a change order. So I think it's appropriate because street resurfacing is one of the Measure K approved expenditures that if we have extra money, well, I'm sorry, I should say available money, nothing's ever extra, right? <laughs> that we, we throw it, that we throw it at, at another residential neighborhood, um, I would be proposing to put this forward in the next street resurfacing project anyways. And if we accelerate it now, it just frees up the money in the next budget cycle to move on to the next residential and arterial collectors in our plan. So the request tonight, I don't want Eric to get mad at me, so I have to read it the right way. So uh, the request tonight is that you um, authorize the 1.1 million of Measure K funds to be transferred, well, not authorized, but recommend to the city council that they authorize it tonight at the February 27 meeting, um, that we, you appropriate the 1.1 million from the Measure K fund to the resurfacing fund, and then authorize the maintenance superintendent to execute that change order with MCK services. So we can add it into our project. 
So, Anne, uh, just a quick question. So the staff report talks about um, the pothole repair and the street resurfacing. So is the 1.1 that you have on the slide here for zone 17, the 1.1? Uh, We're going to be, I'm sorry. So I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out. Uh, it, it includes the potholes. Tim, they're going to, when they're doing it around the residential neighborhoods, they're going to hit the potholes. So, so the, the contractors are in the potholes. It's not an internal. No, no. Sorry, the lights just went off. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I'm in the dark, but I can still see. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, do, do you want to do that separate or do you want to do engineering as well and do both together? Tim? Yeah, so engineering is a separate, you know, ask, Anne, but is that something else you have a presentation on? Because I see that on the staff report. I think that's Anathan. Anathan is doing that. Anathan is doing the engineering ask. Yeah. Um, no, lights came on. Thank you. I'm still in the office. <laughs> oh. And did you want to stop the sharing? And I'll oh, I'm I'll sorry. Ask. Yes. I don't think I can do it. His presentation. All right, I'm going to need a. Oh, here we go, right here. I'm sorry, Jonathan, I apologize. No worries, Ann. Good evening, Mayor Flitty and Councilmember Noack. Here we go again. So let, keep, bear with me, I will share the presentation. Can you see the presentation? There we yes. go. Yeah, there okay. we go. Okay, good evening. Um, the ask is uh, for budget committee to consider some additional funds to um, to this proposed project in front of you. We are all well aware of this project. It's an Oak Park gap closure project. It's in a high priority area given the fact that it connects the neighborhood and our city our residents to the school and the Reckon Park facilities and the East Bay Burnt Trail, and of course, our newly built library. So the sections that we are talking about, you know, completing the sidewalk gap closure, it starts from the Hook Avenue. There's a short section of the Hook, you know, going north, does not have a sidewalk and the remainder has a sidewalk. So that connects the neighborhood. And also from the senior living facility along Oak Park does have a sidewalk and the gap missing portion is from the East Bay mud towards the uh, uh, senior center. So what this project entails is we will be providing a 635 linear feet of ADA compliant concrete sidewalk and we'll be providing five ADA compliant curb brands along with some drainage facility to enhance the existing drainage within that area. And also some rectangular rapid flashing beacon cross work and also class two bike lanes. And you know, as part of that is a lot of the residents including the TSA as well as the uh, seniors who lives in that area have always raised concern about the crosswalk visibility. And this part of this project, we will be enhancing the crosswalk and also providing the rapid flashing beacon to you know, warn the uh, motorists you know, about the people within the street itself. And what we are trying to do is, uh, we are trying to expedite this project in a way that we can complete the construction in the summer and have this walkway available for the kids when they start the fall season. And as you well know, part of the CAP schedule last year, we all approved a $75,000 towards only the design concept, which would take on the next fiscal year. And what we are asking at this point is Move that and keep that budget for the construction for the next fiscal year. As we know, this construction is going to uh, roll over into the next fiscal year and asking for additional $730,000 for this fiscal year for the design 
and for the construction. So altogether, you'll be contributing $805,000 towards the construction and design. And the design is to take place now, soon as this is get approved, and the construction to begin in May, June. And we like to complete this by July, if it's all possible. Can you so go with that, to... I'll be happy to take any questions. Can you just go back the one slide that shows the original CIP approved slide? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, and then go forward again. So you have 68,000 in design and switch to the next slide. And the 68, for whatever reason, drops down to construction, but the design costs go up to 75. And can you just kind of like walk us through this? these numbers so initially when we were looking at it uh, last year we looked at uh, overall cost what it would take to you know do this uh, design so we had an estimate about $68,000 plus our staff time to be about $75,000 and when we start maybe I, maybe I'm, I misunderstood so the 75 that's approved for fiscal year 23 24 um is that disappearing and just moving over to the 22, 23 column? Um, okay, In not totally. So what is happening is that yeah. was that $75,000 that was allocated for the design is actually going into the construction bucket. And since, because we are moving the design this year, so we are, that's why we had to move the numbers. Even though there's a slightly increase in the design cost, because after talking to a few consulting firms and looking at the job in detail, we thought you would need a little bit more money to do the design. That's why we have increased the budget for the design. So is the 805 that's under discussion tonight, in addition to what council approved in the, in the current budget cycle? The, the current budget cycle did not have any money allocated for this okay. project. Everything was in the next uh, year. All right, so let me ask you differently. Is, okay. the, is the 805 in addition to the amount that council has already approved? Or does it include the, the amount already? So go to the next slide, Arvind, I think. Okay, on the next uh, things, you can see that only additional request, if you want to consider, that would be 730. And if you include the 75 pre-approved for the next fiscal year, uh, then it brings out to 805. The only contribution that this budget committee is going to uh, allocate is would be $730,000 for this fiscal year. Did I answer your questions? So in the in the in the in the in the, in the budget. Um, the staff report, it talks about 805, but that's not just in this year, that spans over into next year a little bit as well. The actual increase to this year's budget is the 7, 730, and then next year's budget would be the 75. Correct, it spans two fiscal years. Two fiscal years. But yeah. it does include the previously approved 75, we're just accelerating the expense, I guess. Correct. If, if I'm understanding it. Well, not exactly. The 75 will now be construction in 2023-24 instead of design. Yeah, I think it's just a little number, you know. It's a little, yeah. Manipulation here. I mean, the 75 design was what we approved and the next fiscal year is just going to be some additional construction costs. It just happens to add up to same amount. Um, um, we so, kept the same amount, correct? Yeah. Uh, so I think it is important, Jonathan, to to you know make sure the construction doesn't impact the school year and traffic on Oak Park. I hear complaints all the used to hear complaints all the time from parents uh, that our street repairs always seem to occur during the school year in that area. So uh, although I don't think the sidewalk repairs is as uh, intrusive as as road repairs. Only good thing is uh, right now there's no sidewalk existing there, so people are not using that area. But nevertheless, our goal is to finish it uh, within the summer and have it well before the school begins. 
So at, at the canal trail, there already is a flashing um, warning. Are you installing additional intersection demarcations between the canal and Hook? Yes, there is a two, uh, you know, crosswalks uh, in that area, and we have received several. I mean, people, you know, near miss accidents within the area just because Oak Park uh, it's a very highly traveled uh, way, and uh, we would like to provide that, you know, safety aspect uh, for those two crosswalks just um, east of the Canal Trail. So all three of them are going to have flashing lights. Correct. Uh, I don't have any other questions. Do you, Sue? No, that was no, that was it for me. I just, I just wanted to clarify the crosswalk and where the flashing was going. So, all right. Well, well, this is just a recommendation. It's financial. Do we have any public comment, uh, Eric? Not this time. All right. I will move the item. I'll second it. So we'll recommend it to the city council for approval. And just for clarification, uh, I think I know the answer. Um, action item as well for the, for this one. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Pretty much anything that comes out of budget goes right to action item. <laughs> uh, thank you, and thank you, Jonathan. Always still recording. Appreciate it. All right, moving to item six, the janitorial services contract appropriate additional budget for a new janitorial contract. I assume this is back to you, Anne. It is back to me. Thank you. So make sure I, I just have a verbal presentation for this. <laughs> so, so back in 2017, uh, the city entered into a three year contract with Universal Building Services. That's who we have now, UBS. Uh, to provide janitorial services for City Hall, um, Public Services Center, and the Police Department. <clears throat> the contract did expire in 2020, um, right in the heat of COVID. Um, and you know, we, we, we discussed going out with another RFP. I could not generate any interest from other janitorial contractors. Everybody was citing resources and staffing and everybody was just kind of holding on to what they had and weren't interested in any new work. Um, so we just continued to go month to month with UBS. Um, but I will say over the last couple of years, um, I'm not sure before I got here, but there's been a noticeable decline in the, their quality of work. Um, I've received complaints from all the buildings about the service. I've met with UBS many times over this year to try to get them to correct. Uh, you know, they always come back. They'll always redo um, but I've not seen an uptick in their service. Uh, they cite their staffing issues as the main reason why they're having a hard time uh, keeping up with the buildings. And now that we have the new library in play, you know, they have to step it up even a little bit more. It's the new library. And um, they're just, the resources are very, very thin. So, you know, we've, based on the amount of complaints I receive from all four of the buildings now, um, and, you know, coming out of COVID, there's been a renewed interest in janitorial contracts. In December, I went out with an RFP uh, with a, a scope of work for each building. Um, we had three contractors come in and give us a quote. Uh, they're listed in the staff report, but I'll name them here. It was Frank and Grossman, and then BSM Facility Group, and uh, Welcome Building Services were the three people that came in with an RFP. Um, I know back in 2017, it was a strict RFP and they went with the low bidder. Um, and I'm not sure that's in the city's best interest this time to go with our low bidder. Our municipal code uh, gives us the flexibility to be able to look at other items other than cost. Uh, and given the secure nature of uh, the PD building as well as city hall with the city manager's office and the city attorney's office, and our other buildings, um, I think it's gonna be in our best interest to not go with the low bidder, but to go with a company that we feel can give us the quality service that we need with the staffing that we need and the resources that we need. Um, and I think over the long haul, the city would be better served doing that. So I'm recommending that we go with uh, Frank and Grossman. They have a staff of over 30 people. Uh, they came over here, they walked every building with me twice. Uh, they're fully aware of the work that has to happen and how they're going to put it together. Uh, they have a plan in place if people are sick or if someone goes on vacation or if, you know, 
COVID happened and they have to have staff come to the building. And I, I feel really uh, comfortable and good about the presentation that they brought forward and the service that they can bring to the city. So I'm recommending that we <clears throat> stop the contract with um, UBS and start with Frank and Grossman. Uh, you know, I'm bringing, it, I'm bringing this item, if you guys approve it, authorize it um, to council on Monday night. And I'd like to bring uh, Frank and Grossman on board as soon as possible after that. Uh, right now, what that would mean for our budget is um, we currently have uh, $93,000 out of the general fund for City Hall, PD, and PSC, and $40,000 authorized for the library out of Measure K. Uh, this new contract with Frank and Grossman would require us to increase our budget, not only for this fiscal year, but for next fiscal year as well, because we have a two-year budget in place. So it would be an appropriation of 17230 for the remainder of fiscal year 22-23, and then an additional 47000 709 for 23 24. That would come from the general fund. And that would be for the janitorial services at City Hall, the police station at PSC. Uh, and it would be $9,400 for 22 23 and $36,000 for 23 24 for Measure K at the library. Um, I think that it's an all, all of the RFPs came in higher than what we're paying now. It would have been an increase with all of them. But having met with Frank and Grossman, uh, having met with BSM Facility Group and gone over their proposals, their workforce, uh, and the ability that they can bring to the city, um, I'm going to recommend Frank and Grossman. They currently have contracts with the city of Brentwood and the city of Palo Alto. They clean all the Kaiser buildings, um, and they're fully aware of what needs to be done here. Um, so that is my recommendation. I'm available for questions. What's the length of the contract, Dan? Is it a one-year contract or a two-year contract or what is it? I, I thought we'd go with a one-year contract so that yeah. if we have any mishaps, then we can just go out with another RFP. Uh, well, yep. so it'd be the end of this fiscal year and then next year. Okay. So 15 months. Okay. So just curious, Ann, what the spread was on, on the various um, Proposal the, received from the three. The second, the second bidder without consumables, without consumables. So the eighteen thousand one hundred that you see on yours includes everything. Uh, the second, the second price was thirteen thousand two sixty three without consumables. So mm -hmm. that we would still have to add in everything we needed at all the buildings. So you'd probably add in another three thousand dollars a month. That's what we pay with UBS right now across the board in all our buildings for consumables. So they're not that far off. Just curious with how you were able to determine that Frank and Grossman were the, the best choice. Uh, I, <laughs> I met them. I met they they came over with a full team. They put on a full presentation. They had their uh, supervisor that um, and I believe that in the oh, you'll see it at council, their, their whole proposal. I didn't upload it for the budget committee. Um, mm -hmm. They sent their supervisor over. They met with us. They walked all the buildings with myself and with my admin. They came back a second time. Um, they they sent me a full on proposal. Everybody else just sent me a price. Frank and Grossman sent me a, a proposal with resumes and what they were going to do and how they were going to do it. Um, I asked them to go back three or four times because um, we're going to tweak days. And the, the, for example, the library gets different consumables than uh, the city hall buildings. That's just what the spec is and the type of soap containers they have and the whole bit. And just their flexibility and their ability to meet all of that. And um, they came across very professional, Tim. Well, thank you. Um, so the request is for us to recommend this to council? Yes. Uh, I will move that. Second, recommend. Does anybody need a break? Oh, more sorry, items? just for again, I think I know the answer, but just to verify that that's also uh, yes, an action item. It is. <laughs> we, expect, we expect the PowerPoint with co animated slides and you know, and, and and examples of the co consumables that you're talking about. Oh my <laughs> god! I'm going to bring in three types of soap for you, Tim. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, let's. Anybody need a break?
I'm just going to go fill up, get my glass of water. I'll be right back. So it'll only take me 30 seconds. All right. I'm going to ask for one minute. All right. Oh, all right. All right. I'll be right back. I'm back. Are we ready to proceed? Does anybody need more time? No. Oh, hold, let me uh, restart the recording. Hold on. Thank you. All right. Uh, calling item seven, the update on the American Rescue Plan Act. Back to you, Eric. Final presentation, for, at least for me, for the evening. Uh... <laughs> So the following is a, an update on the American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA, um, as, as you both are aware. Um, the city of Pleasant Hill received an allocation of about $8.3 million. Uh, we've received all that in cash. It, we've put it into its own special revenue fund as of now. Um, and the amount was based on uh, the city's population. The eligible uses um, have stayed the same from public sector revenue loss to economic response, uh, premium pay for essential workers, water sewer broadband infrastructure. Uh, a year ago, city council, we elected to take the standard allowance. So um, up to $10 million you could put into the quote unquote public sector revenue loss. Um, and that was advantageous to smaller agencies like ourselves because it makes the reporting a lot easier. Um, and, and what you have to actually provide the US Treasury is, is much simpler. Um, in, in terms of cost, um, I'm sorry, in terms of reporting purposes. Um, all the ARPA funds need to be spent by December 31st, 2026, as long as uh, they are obligated by December 31st, 2024. Uh, just to give you uh, an update, so the, the allocation of the cash received is about 8.3 million. All of the items that are in the blue are, are, have been approved by council, except for one, uh, which is the digital documentation accessibility project for about 350,000. The budget committee saw that uh, a little over a year ago, that's about 350,000. Uh, Jeff Simmons is uh, finalizing the RFP now with, um, with the attorney's assistance to make sure it has all the ARPA language in it. Uh, once that happens, um, he will release that RFP and that'll eventually, that item will eventually come to city council. Um, including all those items, we have total appropriations so far of about 7.3 million with a, with a little over a million dollars that has not been, um, um, 7.3 million allocated with a little over a million that has not been allocated. T 
taking a look at that same um all of the allocations and what's been spent to date, as you are aware, because as City Council approved the, the completion of the Gregory Garden Storm Drain Project at the last council meeting for about $1.5 million. Um, Diablo View Storm Drain um, has started, but we haven't received any invoices yet. Uh, the business grants assistance for about half a million dollars. We spent about a little less than 100000 I know that Zach has already uh, presented that technical assistance grant program to council, and I'm hearing that he's going to roll out a perks phase two um, in the near future. Uh, the audio visual uh, system in the council chambers, uh, all of those improvements that you've seen um, to help with hybrid meetings for about 145,000 has been spent and done. Uh, you provide about $60,000 to the chamber. Uh, one of the bigger projects is about $1.2 million for the police department underground storage tank uh, design will be later this year and, and hopefully construction next year. And let's see, I'll just touch on some of the other projects like the pond plumbing system project and the fountain project are, are, are out for RFP. And then some of the retention of essential employee uh, pay as part of the MOU negotiations of about $427,000 has been paid out. So again, out of the $7.3 million that's been allocated, about $2.9 million has, has been spent with about $4.4 million uh, remaining to be spent on these various projects and programs. That is the end of my my brief presentation um, for ARPA. Um, again, on the slide here is some of the technology that was used to purchase in council chambers, the Gregory Garden Storm Chain Project, the Pleasant Hill Program, um, as well as the obviously uh, <laughs> employees of the city. Eric, are we pretty comfortable with the estimates that uh, like for the underground storage tank, that that's still going to be sufficient, even though it's done next year. I'm hoping Anne is still on this call to answer that question. <laughs> oh, she is not. She dropped off already. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'll, I'll ask Anne later. It's just one of those things that I think, um, you know, with with the amount of costs that have gone up this year, hopefully they'll flatten out a bit. So we don't have that continue increase because I would be concerned that um, that may not be the same number as what we had originally planned it for. Oh, there's Ann. Oh, there's Ann. 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 Hi, Sue. Yes. Hi. Um, so, hey, we have a 1.2 allocated for the underground storage tank expected to be done in 24. Are we pretty comfortable with that number that it's still going to be able to be done for that in 2024? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to be starting. As soon as I'm done with street resurfacing, I'm going to start the design. I've been working with, um, again, the city attorney's office because we're going to do it as a design build. Oh, okay. And so I've been working with Grant on the paperwork to get that done. Um, but yes, they feel really comfortable with that number. I put a little contingency in there. But okay. Sue, I will, I'll call the guy tomorrow and just have him reconfirm. Okay. Thanks. So I'm just curious, I don't know if you know the answer to this, Eric, that you know some of the items have some remaining balances and... Uh, is there a likelihood that there's going to be a remaining balance? Let's just take the cleaning supplies. It says it's winding down and, you know, we're a little over half uh, have, has been expended. So there's still over 100,000 remaining. Is that something that's going to be returned back to, you know, the unallocated balance? Uh, yeah, that one's a little bit, yeah, that one I can um, answer. Uh, yes, that should probably return some balance back to the unallocated portion because as the uh, the COVID emergency will, is, is about to, about to uh, go away, um, uh, there, there is definitely less and less expense um, going into that bit that's being charged to that. Whatever the balance is, um, will be returned back to the unallocated portion. Right. Same with the Police department radios. It says it's near completion, but there's about a third of the allocation still remaining. Uh, that will. Um, the only reason is that that's a timing issue. Uh, we literally just paid the last um, invoice um, or approved the last invoice. Uh, this either it was either this week or the end of last week for payment. So it was, um, this was as of February 10th, and, and for the most part, that will be completely spent uh, by the time this. If I was to refresh this table, probably today. All right. Um, are there any 
projects that are on the table, but maybe you're not yet presentation ready that staff um, has in mind for the remaining million that's not allocated? And if not, maybe we should just agenda that, put that on the agenda for a future meeting. Yeah, uh, we, we've talked about a number of different projects and certainly we can come back if you wanna schedule that in a separate agenda after we refine some of the numbers. I mean, when we're ready to talk about it, and uh, Sue and I might have some ideas too that we'd wanna put on the table. So uh, sure. maybe take that up at a future meeting. We will do that. Right. Uh, Sue, do you have any other comments or anything? No, on that? that was it for me. No, uh, thank you very much, Eric, for that update. It was very helpful. Um, and then turning to our last agenda, item eight, it is the discussion of the Chamber of Commerce annual report and audited financial statement of the Pleasant Hill Tourism Improvement District. Is that you, Zach? It is. Um, we still have the same issues that we had before. So I'd like to uh, designate some ARPA funds to improving your uh, internet connectivity. Yeah, your internet connection. Um, you are still, you know, but let's see how it goes. Okay, so you can more or less hear me, or at least some of the words that I'm saying, correct? Some. Okay. Every other word or so. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this item is to uh, seek correction from the budget uh, on how the staff to handle the. No, <laughs> that's right. Okay. Yeah, no. It's yeah. no, it's Do you want to just call in on the phone? I can give you that number at 669. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Okay. Hang on. 669-900-6833. You might have to log off. I don't know. We'll have to see if there's any reverb. Uh, definitely have to mute your... You put, it, put yourself on mute and then use the phone. Yeah. And then Eric can admit you. Hey, can you give me the number one more time? The yeah. number again? 669 900 6833. Meeting ID. Meeting ID. Meeting ID. 886. 5435. Tim, start again from the beginning. 886 5435 0320. Need a passcode? Nope, forget it. I thought I could talk to you, but I can't. Uh, yeah, passcode. Passcode is 657. Two zero four. Eric, you'll have to answer the phone. Yeah. Oh, well, there it is. If you can unmute the phone, Eric, I think. No, it's not me. So is your phone muted? No, can you unmute? Uh, can you unmute Zach's phone? There he is. There it is now. Okay, Zach, let's hear you. Okay, fantastic. Okay, fantastic. Oh, wait, let me turn oh. down the volume so I don't hear my own voice. Okay, so you can all hear me, correct? Yes. Okay, so, all right, so this item is um, to uh, seek direction from the Budget Committee uh, on how you want staff to handle uh, the report. It's both an annual report that is due and also, uh, also an annual financial audit. Uh, which are both a requirement of the um, agreement between the city and the chamber, uh, where the chamber manages the Pleasant Hill Tourism Improvement District. This is the five-year agreement that was signed back in 2017. So per that agreement, uh, the chamber is required to present to the city the annual report, the uh, annual uh, financial audit. Uh, and we uh, have not so far received the final uh, report 
and audit. And so we're looking to the budget committee uh, to uh, provide direction to city staff on uh, how you would like us to proceed. And this is really a recommendation for to the city council and staff, right? I mean, I don't think we're the decision makers here, isn't it, city council? Yeah, probably. Uh, well, yeah, if, yeah, if, if I, the city council would have to waive it if we wanted to waive it. Correct. So I'm looking at the staff report and is there a particular provision in the agreement attached to the staff report that we are focusing our attention on that well, can i can i just say a few words on this because this is really confusing and i think it's just it's just a misunderstanding from a lot of parties at the time that the tid went from the chamber to the new entity so in the agreement, it states that they have to do an annual year at the end of every annual report at the end of every fiscal year, including an audit. Their fiscal year is a June 30 fiscal year. There's nothing in the agreement that specifies they have to do one at the end of nine months. Okay, and that's when their period was up. They, there, is a, there is a criteria where the city could ask at any point in time for things, but this is we are a bit relying on this annual report, which it really isn't annual because it's at nine months. Now, there was not clarification since I was on the subcommittee for this transition. There was no clear direction that they had to do a ending audit at the end of the nine month period of time. And actually my understanding is Trish actually thought that they would do an annual report at the end of June, but when she conferred with her, her accountant, for the new TID, they informed her that her year, fiscal year, was going to have to start at the beginning of April, not at June, and so she wasn't going to be able to do it. So there was a, quite a bit of confusion both on the TID, the new TID, and the chamber as to when an audit was going to get done and then how it was going to get paid for. So all the cash that was held by the chamber that would have paid for an audit is now held at the TID. So two confusing pieces. One, there was a miscommunication, a misunderstanding that an audit had to be done at the end of nine months. And to the extent there was, they would have held on the money to pay for an audit. And so it, it, is just, it is just a miscommunication at the time that nobody was clear that they actually had to do an audit at the end of nine months. Um, and and that's, uh, that's really what it comes down to. And now, now that we're the books have been moved over, that you know the year ends over. There's no money there to pay for the audit. Uh, you know the the idea is, can we just waive this requirement for this nine month period and look to the new TID to provide their annual report and an audit at the end of their fiscal year, at their fiscal year, which will be uh, March 30 this year. Yeah, I think the confusion was probably created in the early year of the TID when the chamber requested that it be able to report on an annual calendar year as opposed to the city's fiscal year. No, they they were doing it at June 3rd. The, 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 there, there was quite a bit of confusion at the beginning because when the TID started and when the chamber's fiscal years were different. And so they had to do a stub year to get them all lined up. They also had to change the accounting practices. My understanding was one was doing it on a cruel basis and one was doing a cash. So the whole thing had to be changed over. So they started their fiscal year July 1 of the first year they did it. So they had this three month weird period at the very beginning. And so they were going June 1 to uh, July 1 to, to June 30th. And so that was their fiscal year. And so when the but the contract was up at the end of at the at the end of March. So that's when the new TID started. So it ended up chopping this fiscal year. They didn't come to an end of a fiscal year uh, when the TID went out on its own. And there was no clarity that an audit was going to be required. I wasn't aware of it. There was no discussion of it. 
in any of the meetings I was in that an audit was going to be required at the end of nine months prior to the new TID taking over. And there was actually a discussion that the new TID was going to do it at the end of June after having it for three months, but then they were informed that they actually had to do it April 1 going forward for their fiscal year to be April 1 to March 30. And so they couldn't do it either. So there's that, hence the, hence the misunderstanding, miscommunication all the way around on this, you know, audit that had to be theoretically done at the end of nine months. So I don't know if we know the answer, but in the current contract for the TID uh, responsible party, how do we deal with reporting in the final year of, of that contract? Well, they they don't because they're it's a five year it's it it now coincides because their five years will be up at the end of a fiscal year. Well, the previous one was not up at the end of a fiscal year, hence the problem. I don't know, it might be something that we need to revisit in light of this issue because I don't know if if it wasn't discussed at the conclusion of when the chamber was responsible for the TID. I doubt it was an area of focus. In, in negotiating the new contract, because this contract, no, but is, but it'll be the let same. Me, let me let me no, actually not. Let me just finish here. Um, so this says that the chambers to provide us an annual report each fiscal year. They don't have to do it the first year, but the, the first annual report is due after the first year on or before July 31, 2018, and then on or before September 30 of each year through the term of the district. If that provision carried over to the new contract, you're going to have the same problem in the fifth year of the new contract. It's not. It's not carried over. The new the new contract is a fiscal year, April one to March thirty, and their contract ends on March thirty. So you don't have a timing difference in the new contract. The old but what happens after March? How are they going to report in their last year? And this is really we don't since we don't have it here in front of me. Uh, if they're if the current operator has a March thirty fiscal year end, when are they supposed to make their final audit? There would be a March 30 year end. That's usually not possible to provide an no, it, same day. Yeah, but it, it, their their books would be closed at March 30. And is and, that the same issue no, with the chamber though? That no, the chambers they, was June and they ended in March. But the okay, so the books closed yeah. though. Can they can they give us a a, an ending report on their books. I mean, yeah, er, Eric and Eric and the accountant for the chamber have gone through the numbers because Eric wanted to make sure that all the cash that was remaining in the TID got moved over to the new TID. So we do know that all the cash that was in there was moved over correctly. Can I hear from Eric on that? Apparently, you've had conversations that I haven't been participating. Lots. In. <laughs> so, no, so, uh, so I've worked with the, the chamber and I've worked with the, the the new TID. So I was able to at least verify the uh, uh, the amount that the the, the chamber had uh, transferred over to the new TID. It all uh, agreed with each other. Um, that um, so I was able to do that. I didn't do a full audit. Um, well, um, that was. I didn't have that kind of I didn't have that background for that data, but I was able to confirm at least the amount that was transferred uh, from the chamber to the DID did happen. Did we receive any financials from the chamber at the end that they showed their expenditures and revenue for the last nine months of their operation of the DID? Uh, there, there is very preliminary data, but it's at a very summarized level. What does that mean in reality? Well, so, well, so uh, uh, for example, uh, um, line items are like supplies and services. Uh, I, but it doesn't show you what I could, what I didn't do, and I couldn't do was um, I didn't drill down to detail and say, okay, where are the invoices for? And I'm making this up, the Staples invoice, and verifying that was a legitimate cost. I, could, I did not do that. Well, that's the audit. I'm not asking you whether you audited. I'm just whether they gave you, let's say, unaudited financial statements that showed their revenue and expenses for the last nine months they operated the TID? We did get that, yes. All right. And did those financial statements appear, in your opinion, consistent with prior revenue and expenditures on a prorated basis from prior years? I did not have the data to do that kind of analysis. It was, it was that the information I was doing was making sure that the, 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 
that the it looked like all of the cash had been um, transferred over to the new TAD, and it did look like it, it, that did happen. Well, I get that that the bank accounts were transferred over, yeah. but you know, I mean, we're talking about waiving the audit requirement, and I understand the reasons why that request is being made. But I'm just asking: Do we have any just kind of you know general assurance that in the last nine months the TID was operating? in accordance with the same standards it did for the years that it provided us audited financials. Again, based on what I was looking at, I can't, I couldn't give you a, um, a definitive answer for that piece. I, I can just confirm that the amount of cash was transferred over to the new TID. All right. What about the expenditures of the TID in the final nine months? Has anybody just looked at them generally to determine that they're consistent mm -hmm. with the prior, you know, Nine. It's, going to be it's going to be tough with the COVID, so it's going to be hard to make a comparison. I think year over year on on uh, on costs, just COVID versus non COVID years. I just I assume they'd be less than in the COVID years, and that would, you know. So I mean, just that basic, you know, look. Are the numbers less than the previous year, as you might expect in COVID. And, and I'm just curious, you know, what has been done up to this point, and I'm all. You know, I'm, I'm open to the idea of, of recommending that the audit not be required, but I certainly would want some assurance that somebody's at least looked at this more carefully than I have tonight uh, and, and can provide just some general assurances that uh, appears that in the absence of an audit proving otherwise, things look fine. Well, I think, I, I, you know, I... My concern had originally, you know, way back when at the beginning, we had some issues because there were expenditures that shouldn't have been made, right? We had the issue with a compensation issue that was clearly not authorized or, or not done correctly, right? And so there was a bunch of questions in there and then accountant and a bookkeeper were put in to help clarify that. Um, the, I guess part of the issue here is, is that really what we would be looking at is revenues versus revenues and expenditures versus a budget, which isn't necessarily what an audit does. An audit sort of says, did you account for everything correctly? And verifying that those expenses were accounted correctly. Did you, you know, did the supplies, as Eric said, did you pay for that? But you're not going to see whether they, an audit would not have shown that compensation issue from back yeah, then but, because they would have yeah, accounted yeah, for it correctly. You need to get that technical. I mean, I know what an audited versus an audited financial statement looks like in the process that leads to one and the other, but I can certainly look at a side-by-side -side year to year over year or, or year over prorated year and, you know, certainly eyeball whether anything jumps out as being unusual or odd. And it doesn't sound like anybody's done that, or if they have done it, nobody here on this particular Zoom has done it. And that's all I'm asking. Why hasn't that been done? Uh, you know, maybe the current operator has already done that in terms of developing their budget. Presumably they looked at what prior years. And so did anything, you know, it's just that, that preliminary review, is there anything odd that jumps out at anybody? We, we did, we, we didn't do it year over year, but we did look at it when we were doing the, um, when we were doing the transition, the new TID and the development of the budget for the new TID. We did use the basis of the old TID numbers as the basis for the budget for the new one. Mm -hmm. So we did we did do that. I can't say that um, there was an analysis of the last nine months to the prior year, but we did use that nine months. And the person, uh, uh, Viola, who was doing most of the marketing and the expenditures, you know, remained. And so she was involved in that piece of it in the development of the budget for the following year. So we did we did look at it from that basis on looking at what the budget was for the the upcoming year. Hmm. That's I'd say, but we didn't do a comparison of the last nine months to the prior year, but we did use that last nine months and looked at it in in planning for the budget for the following year with the new new TID. Gotcha. Well you know, putting aside the concerns we had, the way the TID was operated in its first 12 or 18 months of existence, you know, it certainly got its um, ship corrected course and provided, um, you know, 
more than acceptable reporting on an annual basis. Uh, and it sounds from what you described that, you know, this issue of, I'll just call it a, whether it's a final audit, final unaudited report, uh, just nobody paid, nobody, nobody thought of it at the time, right? And so yeah. I get that. I get that. Um, and I get that, you know, the new operator uh, has a fresh, clean start. So they, they know what they received and can build and report off of that. But I do think, you know, if, if it was just me making the decision, so this, is, this would be my position uh, to, to share with the rest of the council, is that somebody should be doing just that side-by-side -side comparison, you know, whether it's Eric or somebody, I'm not asking for an audit, but just assuring us that, you know, nothing looks inappropriate absent an audit. Well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I sort of agree with you. On the other hand, I was kind of relying on our staff that sits on the board that I assume is reviewing quarterly statements to budget on a regular basis as part of that. I, I you know, that's, I'm assuming that our person, whatever staff member sits on the board, Kelly before and Zach now, sees reports from the TID on a regular basis to see how they're doing compared to their budget. I, I you well, know, I, you're, that's- Zach, you're, here. you're here, Zach, let's put Zach on the spot. Yes, yeah, so we do, uh, we have monthly uh, board of directors meetings. And so I represent the city on the TID board of directors. So I see uh, monthly uh, profit and loss statements, and then also the quarterly budgets, as well as the actuals. So that's something that I review uh, every month. And then uh, as soon as we're uh, done with our first uh, annual year uh, with the new TID management, State Pleasant Hill, they'll be coming with an annual report and an annual financial audit, showing you everything that I've been looking at uh, for the past year in an official uh, uh, financial statement, fi financial audit from uh, April 1st of 2022 through March 31st of this year. So let's just focus on the last nine months of the prior operator. You know, that's the period of time we're looking at, right? So you received monthly and quarterly reports. And do you still have those? I mean, did anything seem improper or did you question anything? So those reports, some of those reports would have been received before I started here at the city. I probably saw some of the final months of that nine month period, right, which ended last year. So I didn't, you know, notice anything improper. I was looking at those quarterly statements. They were the first quarterly statements of the TID that I was looking at, right? So I didn't have a historical basis to judge those on. Uh, but I, I did start reviewing those probably the last three to four months of that nine month period. So who was your predecessor, if anybody, on the board for the six months before you started? So Kelly Calhoun would have been the representative for the city before I started on the TID board uh, uh, under the previous management corporation when they were, when it was the chamber. Was, wasn't there any gap, though, between Kelly's departure and your starting? I mean, I'm, I just don't remember whether there was a period that somebody other than Kelly maybe was... Uh, maybe uh, Ethan. Good, uh, good evening. You weren't uh, here. It could have been you. <laughs> I, I can tell you that there was an interim period that I did attend a couple of board meetings, but I, I don't recall uh, reviewing any financial statements, budgets, etc. during that period. Uh, truly as a stopgap measure to have a presence there in the event that there was a question for the city. But I wasn't really filling in, honestly, in an official capacity to be reviewing, much like Zach would do now, or like Kelly may have done in the past. But I see Jim came on the uh, screen as well, so I'm going to pause there. Well, actually, you said pretty much what I was going to say. Uh, Kelly, certainly before she left, uh, she did review all of these, um, all of the reports, and uh, has not had not noted to me any concerns other than um, some initial concerns that uh, uh, I think that uh, Council Member Nowak has, has uh, spoken about. So the staff recommending that we just, you know, close the book, so to speak, on the prior operator and move on? Or does staff not have a recommendation? We don't have a recommendation. Um, 
I I don't know, Eric, if you have any thoughts that you want to have. I, it's really a the you know a council decision on whether or not you feel it's necessary to require it. And if it is, then we would have to work that through. If the council doesn't want to require it, that the budget committee doesn't want to require it, then we'd have to take it to council, and mm -hmm. the council would actually have to um, change that requirement. But Eric, I don't know if you had any other anything else to say. Uh, th th yeah, this is this is um, uh, council's uh, what they would like us to do. Staff does. I don't know. If staff has a recommendation. I mean, I guess what I've shared with uh, with June and with Sue is again as i kind of said earlier i you know i feel comfortable that the, the new gid had received the, the money that they were supposed to receive um i also did note um that yes and, and normally like a jpa there would be a dissolution of what would happen when the when the uh jpa were to end of how things would wrap up and end what kind of audit would be done and in this case um uh, you can interpret that it should maybe there should have still been an audit, but you could also interpret like no, it wasn't uh, clarified in in this agreement, um, which you might normally see in a JPA, uh, where if a JPA dissolves, um, all parties get a final audit, and, and, and it's somewhat clarified how that would be done. Um, in this case, it, it was not there, uh, so I did share that with June. I did share that with uh, Councilmember Noah. Well, I thought the chamber was doing a fine job in in the latter year or two uh, and under Viola and doing very well. I'm surprised that they elected to not want to renew. So, um, you know, in, in the absence of anybody raising red flags, uh, you know, I'm happy to recommend this to council uh, for them to, you know, decide. You know. But I, I I think the agreement is 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 in hindsight obviously doesn't address the situation uh compounded by it wasn't discussed at the time the transfer was being negotiated and implemented um and I would like and I'll, I'll ask the city attorney to take a look at the current contract to make sure that this is not another issue that will resurrect again at the end of the of the current term so that you know that it's yeah, clarity, what is the recording? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Zach. Oh, I was just uh, chiming in regarding the current contract with Bay Pleasant Hill. So their uh, annual report and their financial audit coincide with the beginning of their tenure. So their annual report and fiscal audit will cover uh, uh, April 1st through March 31st each year of their five-year term. So there won't be a nine-year sliver at the end. Um, now, if they come to the council and, and request to change their fiscal audit period to a July 1 to a June 30th period, uh, as you know, that's what happened with the chamber back in 2020, then this discussion that we're having now obviously will inform that discussion. But as of now, everything is in sync. Okay. Um, I think everybody's answered the questions I have to the best of your ability, so... Well, we will um, then uh, send this along to the council. Uh, I would say that this is an action item. Um, Absolutely. Uh, you know, I don't want to belabor the point. You know, I think maybe all of us are, are somewhat just have some, you know, residual um, uh, negative uh, memories of, of how this started and how poorly managed it was in the beginning. That is really what concerns me today because I, like I said, I think that course was properly corrected when the problems were alerted. Um, and uh, I, I do, you know, in a perfect world, I would want, you know, something more than what Eric's providing uh, as assurance that, you know, given, given you know, our responsibilities to to the electorate and the amount of money involved here, that it's something other than just verifying the ending balance was the beginning balance between the two operators. Uh, you know, would have preferred somebody looking at the, the, the monthly profit and loss statements and just saying they looked at it, it's consistent with the prior operation. 
you know, just giving that kind of verbal assurance. And if those records are still available, I'd ask staff to take a look at that. So when this does come to council, they can just make that representation that the records were received, reviewed, they were consistent with the prior full year. Uh, and, you know, based upon, you know, the two or three of you that, you know, filled in on the last um, nine months that, you know, that you have confidence that the TID was operating in accordance with the standards of our contract. And, and then Eric says, yes, and the ending balance was the beginning balance. So I mean, those are my thoughts. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I agree. In a perfect world, I would love to have seen an annual audit. And it, it just, you know, we had between Kelly being gone and some timing issues there and, it, you know, and a change of year and a not clear understanding of, you know, of, of what we had to do at the end of, a, of a, the conclusion of this, of the State Pleasant Hill under the chamber versus I, there was just, you know, there was just a lot of misses all the way around. Uh, and, and hopefully, um, you know, Eric has seen a bit of the books and can look back at the previous year to see that it makes some sense. I'm sure we have the annual report from the prior year and we have nine months. We should be able to do that, include that in there. But um, no, a, lot of, a lot of lessons learned from a lot of lessons learned from this one. Well, exactly. It doesn't appear that anything's been lost. Uh, it's been a learning curve. I, I do think it is remarkable that the chamber thinks it doesn't have any reporting obligation, even on a, on a, on a truncated year. Uh, that just strikes me as unprofessional. No, so, no, no, they thought that the TID was going to do the full year. That was the discussion. The TID thought they were just going to pick up the books, do three more months, and do an annual report. So it wasn't that they didn't think there was going to be a reporting. They just thought the TID was going to take over, do the last three months, and then report annually as if nine months of underneath the chamber and three months under the new TID. They did not realize, nor did we, that there had to be this cutoff. Right. So that it wasn't that there wasn't going to be a reporting. They just thought the new TID was going to do it. But I, I get the sense that that wasn't discussed. That's just what they thought. No, no, it was discussed. And I mean, this is what I was saying. Trish said, Trish said, you know, oh, I talked to my accountant, found out I can't do that. I have to start new books. Gotcha. And at that point, it already moved over. So there was a discussion about it. And that had sort of been the understanding. There wasn't anything documented, but that was the understanding at that point in time. And I certainly thought that was the case as well in part of the discussions, not knowing any better myself that, that we had to do that. So I thought we were going to see a annual report, nine months under the chamber, three months under the new entity. And that just couldn't be done. We just didn't know that. All right, thanks for clarifying that. that that's important. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think we're done on this item unless anybody has anything further. All right, that's our ninth and final item, uh, setting a date for our next budget. <laughs> I was about to say, God, we have something else. <laughs> maybe, maybe more frequently than the last meeting, November 30th to February 22. So that our agenda won't be as and you know, I won't have you burning the midnight oil so much. Anybody? What time works for you, Tim? Um, we were doing well in my prior tenure, we were doing like eight or eight thirty in the morning, I think on a Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, which is fine with me. You know, I don't think I've ever proposed a nighttime budget committee meeting. Just oh, okay. I thought this was done to accommodate you. Eight, no, eight o'clock is eight eight thirty is fine with me. Yeah, I'm just gonna say this was June's idea. So. Oh, okay. No, that that's we can do a eight eight thirty. That's fine with me. Uh, so, uh, do we need to meet in March? So, I, I'm just gonna throw out a date, and you you can you can uh, say yes or no. I'm just I'm just gonna say March twenty second at eight a.m. That's good because I leave March 29th and I'm gone for three weeks. So, <laughs> yeah. and as I said, my plan was to assuming that they're both available to do to have Pars and Chandler uh, do give you an update. Yes, yeah. March 22, 8:30 a.m. Is that what you said? 8:30 is fine too. <laughs> what did you say? 9 a.m. I said eight, but because you said eight, eight. No, eight I, 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 I'm sorry, I should say 8:30 because technically. Um, yeah, we technically don't start till eight thirty. So, 
I should say 30. Mm -hmm. uh, that's fine. So March 22, 8.30 a.m. We will adjourn to March 22, 8.30 a.m. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. And thank you for all your help tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.